Welcome. Welcome to the City Council meeting of June 25th, 2019. I'd ask you to mute your cell phones, everybody, including us. Uh, and uh, we will, first, I want to just tell you that the mayor is, will participate fully in this meeting on the phone. So she's right there on the phone and including any public hearing and, and vote that we take tonight. Uh, and that was approved in the consent agenda at our last meeting. But I will be running this meeting. So if we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We don't have any proclamations tonight, so I'll move on to the consent agenda. So uh, we do have a, an addition to the consent agenda that, um, and I'll read the title of it, is the resolution asking Governor Roy Cooper to veto House Bill 370 and indicating our support of this action and our elected Sheriff Quentin Miller. So if I could get a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. May I get a second? Second. second. Okay. Uh, so I'll open it up for any uh, council members to comment. Uh, at, at this time, I would just like to read the resolution. Whereas we are mandated to provide service of public safety for all residents of the city of Asheville, and whereas we are grateful for our neighbors and all the gifts that they bring to the city of Asheville, and whereas we recognize the strength that we have as a community when all of our residents and all of our neighborhoods can live without fear, and whereas the people of Asheville and Buncombe County duly elected Sheriff Quentin Miller under the mandate to fulfill his promise to keep the full community safe and not cooperate with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and whereas North NC House Bill 370 would make it mandatory, mandatory for North Carolina sheriffs to do something the federal government has said is voluntary to cooperate with ICE and detainers. And whereas because these detainers are not tied to criminal cases, they would require local sheriffs to hold individuals without probable cause in violation of their constitutional rights. And whereas forcing sheriffs to act as an extension of ICE diverts much needed taxpayer resources away from education, health care, child care, housing, and other resources needed by every person in Asheville. And whereas making sheriffs comply erodes the community trust in local law enforcement, decreases the voluntary reporting of crime, and spreads fear throughout our immigrant communities. And whereas we believe that the best of our humanity and the best of our local government happens when we support the full worth and dignity of all people, and their families by helping to keep them safe in our community and together. And whereas we as a community are committed to protecting each other and making Asheville a safe, safe place to live in. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city council, or the city council of the city of Asheville. That. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll go over the rules. Uh, we don't clap. We can do this, um, but uh, I'd ask you not to clap or, or boo or hiss or anything like that. If you um, disagree with what someone is saying, this, something like that will work, but no clapping or other noises. Uh, anyone else, anyone else on council have anything? So I'll, we'll have public comment now about anything on the consent agenda. So I'll go, I'll go over the rules. Uh, you have three minutes to speak, and you'll see in front of you there's a, there'll be a green light, and that okay. says go, and then the yellow light says you're getting close to the end, and the red light says stop. So um, welcome, and if you'd say your name, and then go ahead with your public comment. Uh, my name is Poncho Bermejo, and I, thank you so much for signing the program, la, the, this paper that you're signing. I forgive the name. Uh, I think then this 
is like very powerful for our community because a lot of times we know feel that we are welcome in this city and in this nation. So you can see that it's not a lot of people that look like me here because we know feel that this this place belong to us, even then we work here and we pay taxes here and we have been spending a lot of the times and we are a big part of the bone of this city. We know feel that we belong to here. So I think that this for me is a big signal of welcome for our community. Because like, I can tell you that I have been see kids crying because all the no welcome signs that are in this country, or mamas crying, or fathers crying. So for me, this is a big, can some that is a small proportion that you sign something only for us means something big, a, a, a big, a, a more welcome place. You are making more welcome this place for us. So thank you so much for doing this. And I bring a present for you. So I make this one so you, I can bring you there. Well, the say stop HB370, then like I said, for me, the HB370 is one of the biggest racist things that have happened since all the time that I have been here, then uh, take the power from the black sheriffs, and in the, in the same time, is a terror, terrorizing our community. Then a lot of people are thinking, oh, it's, I, it's ISIS or other terror, terror, terrorists that came from other countries when we have institutions that terrorize our communities and we are not doing nothing. So for me, then you saying this, it's very powerful because you are saying that you are not okay with the institution terrorizing our communities and our kids. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> very good. Okay. Good evening, I'm Reverend Amy Cantrell, and I just want to equally say thank you for this resolution. It's a very courageous resolution that we much need in this time. And to, to also say, as Poncho said, that we have seen so many people in our community, incredible people who are offering their gifts of love and service to make our city what it is every day. Um, Yesterday we stood on the sidewalk as workers got off work and were sharing water and unfortunately we had to share know your rights information because these are the people whose rights are constantly being violated in a community and in a country where we believe in, in our human and civil rights. And so I thank you for standing up and for standing with our Sheriff Quentin Miller to make sure that every person, every person in our city is honored <coughs> doesn't have to, we, we have too many people right now going to sleep at night. You know, we have children who are scared to go to school every day because of what we see happening in our public schools and the violence. And then at, at night they wonder if they're, when they go home from school, if their parents are gonna be there. I had the experience recently during the last ICE raid. We had a call and a woman had gone to an appointment and she called us because she was afraid to leave the building to go home. She's a single mom. She has a young son in elementary school. And so I said I would pick her up and I went to pick her up at this appointment and she laid down in the back seat of my car because she knew to be afraid that the color of her skin would show such that she would be a target. And she was so afraid that her son would come home from school and their mom would not be there and that he would then be alone. I had no family here. I can't imagine as a mother what that felt like, but to see a woman who lowered herself to get lay in the back seat of my car, there are people doing this in our own community. She asked me, do you mind taking one stop? I said, not a problem. She asked me if we could go to the public library to return books, and I put children's book after children's book after children's DVD in the library return slot. That's what kind of mother she is, and yet she's afraid. And so thank you, thank you for protecting this woman and so many like her who are the vibrant backbone of our city. The other day we had a gathering, and one of the beautiful things that we did is we asked everybody to stop during the gathering and talk to somebody and say, I will protect you. And we asked people to trade phone numbers and to, to tell each other about themselves because we know that relationship and community is what keeps us safe and strong. 
So thank you for being in relationship with all of our community. Thank you. Any other comments on the consent agenda? Okay. I just would like to point out on the resolution, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, number D, that to highlight that we will be having a meeting on, it'll be a work session on July 2nd at five o'clock to discuss districts, districting, and that will be held at the Banquet Hall of US Cellular Center. Just wanted to point that out. So I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. So moving on to the city manager report. Thank you. Um, good evening and thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I have two items I'd like to update council and the community on as part of um, my manager's report. First, I'd like, I'd like to thank council members and staff that attended or participated in the press conference uh, yesterday sponsored by Attorney General Josh Stein's office in coordination with our own um, Asheville Police Department, um, our voice, Buncombe County Sheriff's Department, and the District Attorney's Office. The event was held to bring attention to the need for funding to address the backlog of sexual assault kits that need to be processed and tested. Attorney General Stein shared that of the total number of kits that are awaiting testing, the Asheville Police Department has submitted the most kits of all the communities in the state. This means that all kits currently in the possession of the Asheville Police Department have been reviewed and either already sent in for testing or are ready to be processed. This is incredibly important as was shared yesterday, and I quote, each kit represents more than a victim of a crime. It represents a survivor. I want to personally thank the APD for their hard work in getting these kits submitted to hopefully bring closure for the survivors and to hold those responsible for committing these crimes accountable. My next update, and we'll be doing a presentation, and I will call up uh, Deputy Chief Bun Stark in, in just a moment, but I wanted to um, say a few words. Um, you can go ahead and if you can go up and just change the first start. I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Chief Bun Stark to provide a brief update on um, a disturbing trend that is occurring in Asheville related to gun violence. I can't say definitively that these types of crimes are increasing everywhere, but as you know, I am from Charlotte. And according to the Charlotte Observer, as of June 20th, 2019, there were 56 homicides committed in just six months, which is just short of the 58 homicides committed for the entire year of 2018. Yes, I know I'm in Asheville, but I still have a lot of friends and family in Charlotte. As part of this presentation, I wish Jim could answer the question of why these types of crimes are increasing in Asheville and in other communities. But mostly, I wish he could say we have a solution. But what we know for sure is that these acts of violence can't be solved by APD alone. It will take a community-wide effort to both own and help address this complex issue in our community. Now I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Chief Bunstark for the update on the presentation and the data, and certainly he will be available for any questions that you all may have. Thank you. Okay, so I want to thank you for this opportunity to give you an update on the gun violence. Um, I'll be, be providing some data around the current gun violence that is affecting our city and our community. C can you and speak I'm, a little bit more into the microphone? Sorry. Sure. Just want to make sure everybody can oh, hear you. Fine. Thanks. So um, I'm going to be providing some data around the current gun violence that is affecting our city and communities. I'm also going to be provide some recommendations. But before I get into the data, I wanted to summarize some highlights. Uh, gun violence crime is up 14% to date uh, in the city of Asheville, and that's from June 1st uh, to June 23rd, this year versus last year, um, with an increase overall of 55% since 2016. Homicides, thank goodness, are down 60% from last year, although robberies 
<laughs> Alarmingly, we're up 26%, and aggravated assaults are up 16% from last year. Five of the top 10 locations to which APD receives gun calls are in and around public housing communities, including the top three locations. We can and must work together to address this complex issue. Um, yeah, I like the, everybody's favorite part, the data. So uh, it's very important to note that the data discussed tonight is only as it relates to gun violence and not to overall violent crimes in the city, meaning that what we're gonna talk about tonight are all crimes that were used a uh, gun or a weapon um, and not ones that didn't. Um, so, and it also doesn't include categories such as rape. Um, this first table highlights the number of gun violence crimes reported within, in the percentage change from 2018 to 29 year to date. Um, so you can see in 2018 we went from, five, once again, this is once again June 1st to June 23rd, so we're comparing apples to apples from last year to this year. Um, you can see the 60% in uh, reduction in homicides, 26% increase in robberies, and 15% increase in aggravated assaults, which is a total increase of 13.9%. Uh, this graph is a month-by-month -month breakdown of the same data on violent gun crimes. Um, these are actually reports that were taken by the APD, so they're through um, CAD data. Uh, as you can see, the year started off, we're about the same. Uh, we dipped a little in February, and then we started uh, increasing. And you can see that May was incredibly uh, a violent crime in month for our community. As of June 23rd this year, APD responded to 360 gun calls. This is calls from gun discharges, gunshot wounds, and person with a gun. That's a 15% increase over 2018. The first quarter started off, once again, about the same, and since uh, April, we've had almost double-digit increases in uh, calls, for, um, calls for APD. This density map shows the top 10 locations to which APD responded for gun calls. Uh, you need to note that five of these locations are in and around public housing communities. Uh, of the top 10 calls for service, um, people that lived in Piscoview, Deaverview, and Hillcrest areas combined for more than half of all calls for gunshot wounds, gun discharges, and persons with guns. Excuse me, I need clarity around that. Sure. So you're are you saying that the people that live within the community or are you it, just getting it, calls concerning people who could perhaps be in the community but not of the community? Yes, sir, ma'am. Okay. People that are in and around the communities. So when, when we pull the data, you have to do a, uh, do, I'm sorry, do a like, matrix around it to pull it on the map to pull it up. So yeah, I think it's within a quarter mile of the actual apartment complexes. Okay, I just wanted to give clarity because I know as a community when we're addressing this issue, we need to also debunk a lot of the myths. So when we say that we have a lot of calls in public housing, then automatically we think that the people who live in public housing are the problems when, when they're really right. victims. No, there are people not. from outside of right. Asheville and other counties right. that come into our public housing areas and are causing a lot of the disturbances. Right. So I just want to put that out there so that we have a great understanding as yep. we move forward. Yes, ma'am, I 100% agree with you. These are just people that are calling, not people that are responsible for it. These are just the calls that we're getting Thank from you. these communities. Yes, ma'am. Uh, year to date, violent crimes, uh, to put things in historical per, uh, perspective, since 2014, other than 2016, each year we have seen an increase in gun crimes over year over year. Uh, 2019, year to date, we have an increase of 14% over 2018, and since 2016, we've had a 55% increase. Once again, these are gun crimes, not gun calls. These are actual uh, things that had a report in charge. So what can we do in Asheville to help prevent gun violence? Um, crime prevention and reduction must be a community effort. It's not just a police effort. APD is just one part of a combined effort. Uh, our entire community must join in this effort if we uh, have any chance of being successful. So what's APD doing? So in the last 30 days, we've formed a special task force working with state and federal partners. We're using data to deploy resources to areas experience violence and gun crimes. We're increasing presence and engagement of residents, business owners, and property owners in impacted areas. 
and we're collaborating with community organizations to identify and respond to root causes of violent crime. Can I ask you a question about that? You said sure. just in recent days you've convened that group? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and is the, um, so, uh, I don't know if I can go back. So the, I don't know how to go back. Well, that's all right. So there was the group, and then you're, there were all those other things. Are there is the is the group that you've convened um, just state and federal partners, or do you also have community organizations, so or, or will you be including police, community organizations in that? We do community organizations. We're, we're trying to do outreach to community organizations, but this is specifically a task force. The APD okay. has partnered with other with Buncombe County, some of the um, our federal partners to deal with just the gun violence because last month. I can't even go back that far. There was yep. a huge spike. Yep. So yep. we knew we had to do something. Okay. So we put a group of people just to deal with the gun violence part piece Great. of it. Thanks. Uh, Jim, just, just on that as well, you, you've got the, um, the, the using data. So for, for those of you, for those, of, for those folks who probably this is the first time maybe they're seeing some APD data, can you talk a little bit about your comp stat? Meetings. Those, those are those are uh, the way where you guys actually go over the data. I mean, we, we are invited as council members. I think there's actually one tomorrow mm -hmm. um, that uh, they should all hold a monthly. Can you talk a little bit about those and just how APD kind of approaches these issues and and you know, specifically gun violence as well as as well as uh, sure we have a, uh, every month we have a comstat and the uh, district commanders and the executive staff and officers are invited in. And our crime analysts, we have two of them, sit down and break down all of the crimes. They do it by area, they do it by numbers, they do it by um, the number of crime, uh, the, the areas that they're in. Uh, then we talk about the month before, the areas we saw, uh, what issues that they were going to address. We then talk about what each uh, division commander did to try to address that problem, and we take the things that work. And we move them forward and we take the things that didn't work, reevaluate them, and either tweak them to see if they'll work or we just get rid of them and go with what's working to reduce whatever crime it is we're looking at. We look at um, uh, larceny of um, uh, cars, we look at, I mean, all the top, uh, top things. Uh, uh, burglaries, um, gun violence, obviously. We look at pretty much everything and break it down all into numbers. On, and then we have the, um, the analysts will take all the uh, information and they actually have a predictive software that they'll make a guess on whether it's moving from one part of the city to another part of the city mm -hmm. uh, and, and can give us a break it even down to a time of day when they think this crime is going to occur on what days of the week. So that's some of the things they use to allocate their resources throughout the, the next month to try to address the problems. And Jim, not, not, to, not to take you a little bit off task on this, but, but we also saw, as you said earlier, an uptick in violence last year as well. Um, obviously, this, this year is growing faster than it was last year, which is, which is concerning. But can you, talk a little bit about, uh, can you talk a little bit about what APD did last year? Because if, if I'm not mistaken, you were, all, you were able to tamp down some of the, some of the spikes in, in areas by, by, um, by taking some proactive measures. Um, unlike last year, we didn't actually put together a, a task force because it wasn't that big of a jump. But we, uh, these CompStat meetings, like I said, uh, they'll pick um, an area and they'll take uh, resources and bring them down at the times and the days of the week that they think they're actually going to occur. Um, we also have our, um, uh, some of our specialty units um, look at um, uh, trends. In, in their areas, like the um, drug suppression unit, and our friends, some of our people that are on federal task force, looking at um, stolen vehicle. You know, if there's a stolen vehicle ring, um, and we'll see if there's ties back to our community exactly where in the community that is, and then we'll focus our efforts in that piece. So, and just one final thing, and I'm glad Councilwoman Smith brought this up because, in terms of looking at and, and looking at kind of the the issues that some of the folks in the public housing communities are facing. Um, you know what I have heard both from from um, from the housing authority as well as from you all is that a large proportion of of um, the issues that are occurring over there are happening from folks who don't live there. Uh, in fact, I think you all made some arrests a couple of days ago or a week ago in some shootings where the, where the individuals were, well, individuals are from from Hendersonville. Uh, and so I don't know if you're able to elaborate a little bit more on that. But but again, in terms of kind of. Under, for, for, some, for the public, who this may again be their first time of understanding, can you, can you give us kind of any insight in terms of 
um, kind of history and and uh, uh, you know what's what's happening within those communities as best as APT can tell. Okay, that, I didn't. I'm going to tell you, I didn't prepare that, sure. so I can't give you facts and figures. I, I do agree that the calls are coming from inside the communities. Not all of the players and the people causing the violence are from the communities. I don't actually have those numbers, so I don't want to sure. give you something that's not correct. So, I have a few. <clears throat> excuse me. I have a few questions, just to piggyback off of uh, what Councilwoman Smith said. So. With the, the data that you do have, based on the year-to-date violent gun crimes that have actually been charged, I would be interested in drilling down a little bit to see, and I'm pretty sure you have it, maybe not at this juncture, but uh, in the immediate future, of those, of those crimes that were charged year to the, up to now, what are the uh, demographics, age, race, and similarity of crime, and where the uh, defendant uh, resides. Uh, sure. That's some basic information that I'd like to know based on the fact of, you know, calls coming from these areas and what Councilman Kapoor said and what Councilwoman Smith said as far as the calls are coming from these areas, but per se, uh, the assailants aren't from these areas. I'd like to actually drill that down and get to know factually if that is the case. And uh, again, just to reiterate, uh, age, race, sex, uh, similarities of crimes, what crimes were charged, and uh, where they actually reside, and that would help uh, me um, look just kind of generally of possibly, uh, you know, just kind of get a, a better hold on what's going on, and then I could ask, uh, ask more questions from there. But that's some general information that I'd like to request. Okay, so are you asking, and just to clarify, I, I know we have that information. Are you, are you talking just on the gun violence, or are you talking about? Yes, the year-to-date violent gun crimes that okay. have actually been charged. Okay. That have actually been charged. Of those, of those that have been charged in these top five areas, specific demographics of the individuals that have been charged, their race, their age, their sex, uh, where they actually reside, what their, what their home address is, mm -hmm. and then similarity of crimes. You know, was it uh, 15 gun viol uh, violent gun crimes for robberies? Was it drug related or whatever the sure. crime was, group those together. Yeah, that's not a problem. Get that. I don't have it here, but I can certainly get that for Of you. course. Yeah. Any other before I start finish? Okay. Uh, so, you know, when we ask what can the community can do, right, uh, we need to continue uh, and engage input and open dialogue about violence, drug epidemic, and gang violence. Um, those aren't the only reason I think we're having an increase in gun violence, but it is certainly some of the factors of why we're having increase in gun violence. Uh, we need residents to be aware of what's happening in their neighborhood, in their own neighborhoods. Uh, we need them to take a stance against violence, and if you see something, hear something, right? Um, you don't, we're not asking you to give your name, we're not asking you to give your address and your phone number, but if you see something, that if they see something that's not right, they, we would like them for, to call. I would rather go down and find out there's absolutely nothing than go down and find a shooting, you know, an hour after they saw something that they didn't think was right. So, um, you know, if there's one thing to take away from this presentation, it's that APD cannot do it alone. You know, we're not going to be able to rush our way out of this increase in gun violence. Uh, it's going to take an entire community working together with everyone having specific roles and coming together, speaking out, and doing what they can individually and co collectively to address this complex issue. And now I had questions. If you got any more questions. I just want to say that the, the community really has to feel that they have the power to stand against gun violence. And um, some of the recent murders within the last two years that have really shook the community have been crimes against women and crimes against children. So when we talk about being proactive or even reactive around things we see and things we know, it takes a lot of confidence. Confidence in your community, confidence in law enforcement to protect you. Um, as you stand up, as you, as you continue to stand in your community, for your community. So my question is, 
how are we protecting people when they do stand up? How can we assure that their voice is heard and that they have a community behind them as they stand to address a lot of the, the violent issues? I guess I'm, could you say that? I'm, what, what are we doing to protect individuals who stand up and individuals who may have to testify or make statements? Um, so, so if you, you make a, a statement and you give a, a, a statement to the police, we don't release that information. Um, we have the, um, um, I'm trying to remember, I, I apologize, the, um, it's not Crime Watchers, it's, um, it's like Crime a tip Stoppers. line. Crime Stoppers line, which you can call an anonymous. Uh, you can call 911 anonymous. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping as we, we move forward in this uh, relationship with the community that we get those um, relationships where we can have those open dialogues and, and people do feel comfortable coming up and may not be talking to the entire police department, but maybe one or two people they feel comfortable talking to. I can tell you we have some uh, great detectives that do a phenomenal job uh, investigating these and all they want is the facts and the figures and, you know, they, they go uh, up and above and try to, even if someone gives information they don't want to be known, they try to go a different avenue and a different way to find the same information so we don't need to use that person's name in a tip or in court, so. Thank you. Is there a telephone number if somebody were to want to call in other than 911? I, I think just For the, the Crime Stopper? Um, I don't have the Crime Stopper's number here. 255-5050. I can honestly say I've never called that before. So, <laughs> right. yeah. so the number seems 252-1110 is a non-emergency number. So. Okay, thank you. Or you can go online and look me up. You're more than happy to call me. So. Okay. I do have one other question yes, before sir. you go. Do you all anticipate trends? We the, try to the violence, And what is the forecast that do you have the forecasted anticipation of what the trend is moving forward? I can tell you combines. tomorrow. I mean, that's our comp stats tomorrow, so we'll be sitting down looking at what the trend was tomorrow. There was a, there was a the uh, analyst did predict that um, there was going to be a slight increase in the gun violence, and that's why we put, and we saw part of it, and they said it was going to increase if we didn't do something. So that's why we put together the task force and started reaching out to business owners and the community <laughs> trying to get them engaged and help us as a multiplier. Is that your question? Uh, generally, yes, but not really. I guess I'll have to come to the comp stat tomorrow. Okay. If you'd like to come to comp stat tomorrow, that's, that's all we talk about is the trends coming in the next month. I'd just like to make two other points. So, so first off, thank you for doing this. This is, I mean, I think I've been on council for almost a year and a half. This is the first time we've had a presentation on crime data um, since I've been on council. And so I, I appreciate it. I appreciate the manager. Um, uh, uh, making this as part of the report. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that in a couple of months you'll be able to come back and, and we'll be able to see some of those things plateau. Uh, and, and, and I appreciate all, all the work that, that APD is doing and understanding that this is not something you all can do on your own. I, I was uh, uh, just struck by one thing that the uh, city manager Campbell said as she was going through there. She added a word to the presentation. Uh, she added the word own. Uh, in terms of the community, and I think that's critical for all of us here. Um, regardless of where we come down on police issues or other types of issues or social issues, no, nobody wants to see people getting shot in this city. No one wants to see kids getting shot in this city. Uh, and in terms of owning it, you know, that starts with us here on council as well, in the community and otherwise. So um, if there's things that you all think, staff, APD think that we can do on council, or I'll, and I'll speak for myself, I can do over here, let us know, please. Uh, because you know, if we have relationships in the community, we need to start developing those as well uh, to, to be able to get folks to, to, to feel confident that they can talk to us and, and more importantly, just feel safe in their own neighborhoods. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be living in a community where I would be afraid of my kid's life when I send them out to play at night. I cannot imagine what that is like. And that is happening in certain communities in Asheville. It's not happening in my community. Right, but it is happening in other communities in Asheville, and so I, I appreciate the work you all are doing. You can't do it on your own, and um, you know uh, uh, I, I invite you to to let us know what we can do here on council to help you all out. I appreciate it. Anything else? Thank you. No, thank you. Appreciate it.
Thank you. That concludes um, my report. That's Mayor. great. Thank you. So we're going to move into public hearings. So the first is a public hearing to consider a street name change of the most southern portion of Park Avenue North to Artful Way and Stuart Robaus here. Thank you, Ms. Vice Mayor. Mayor and Council, my name is Stuart Rohrba. I'm the City of Asheville's E911 Address Coordinator. Uh, on the behalf of my director, Mr. Woody of the Development Services Department, I'm here to present a staff-initiated request for a public street name change of Park Avenue North to Artful Way. The street name Park is a common street name. It's the most popular street name <laughs> in America. <laughs> and it's a favorite here in Buncombe too. <laughs> we have 19 streets named Park. Wow. Um, it's spread throughout the various emergency response districts areas, but in one Asheville neighborhood, the West End Clingman Avenue area, we have four different streets named Park, and that can be confusing. The street name City Council is holding the public hearing on today is Park Avenue North. It is in the weekend neighborhood. Park Avenue North was split into two different street segments after a 1970s era um, project that rerouted Clingman Avenue to Haywood Road. So the most northern section, it begins in the higher elevation at West Haywood Street, it serves about 20 structures. Uh, as the elevation goes down, um, it dead ends into a bear cave with no street turnaround. The most southern section is the proposed section to be renamed to Artful Way. It begins off of Robert Street near the Wedge Building. It climbs a small ridge, it's about 600 feet in length. It too dead ends into a barricade with no street turnaround. It used to serve three homes, but there are no habitable structures on this section of street now. Um, staff surveyed the abutting property owners' opinions. We solicited uh, input from the community at large. A variety of different street names were proposed. Um, the neighborhood organizations, We Can and RADBA, they weighed in on the street name, including Artful Way. Uh, changes to existing public street names are to be approved through a resolution following a public hearing. Notice that this public hearing has been posted along the street, published in the newspaper, and mailed to all affected property owners. The Public Safety Committee reviewed the renaming, renaming request at their March 23rd meeting. Staff requests council to hold this public hearing and if appropriate, adopt a resolution changing the most southern portion of Park Avenue north to Artful Way. Unless you had questions of staff, I'll step aside and let the public be heard. Any questions? <coughs> so I'll, I'll open it up to public. I'll open up the public hearing. And I will close the public hearing. Uh, so I would entertain a motion to adopt. Uh, I'll make a motion to adopt a resolution changing the name of the most southern portion of Park Avenue North to Artful Way. Second. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, great. So you're up again, Stuart, for a public hearing to consider a street name change of Wilbar Avenue to Lee Garden Lane. Thank you again. Um, Lee Walker Heights was a property that was rezoned to allow a complete redevelopment of the entire existing housing development. Um, the developer requested a, a, the name to be proposed as uh, for the new access drive is Lee Garden Lane. Uh, there's a short portion of what appears to be a public right-of-way of Wilbar Avenue. It connects to Short Cox Avenue. And since that portion of right-of-way does appear to be public, only City Council could consider that street name change. Uh, timing for that change is about right because there are no occupied structures in Lee Walker Heights at this time. So no one would endure a street address change. Uh, changes to the existing public hearing, changes to existing public streets require uh, the resolution following the public hearing. Notice that this hearing was posted uh, along the street, published in the newspaper, and all um, adjoining property owners were mailed notifications. Uh, the Public Safety Committee reviewed this renaming request at their May 23rd meeting. Uh, staff requests the council to hold the public hearing and, if appropriate, 
approve a resolution changing the street name of Wilbar Avenue to Lee Garden Lane. Unless you had questions of me, I'll step aside. I'll open up the public hearing. And I will close the public hearing. May I get, have a motion? Make a motion to adopt the resolution to change the street name to Wilbur Avenue from Wilbur Avenue to Lee Garden Lane. Brian seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Oh, you want to know why? No, no, I don't want to know why. <laughs> I was going to say that, but it, it, sure, I'll say it. Okay. Uh, a lot of folks that used to live there, once upon a time, there is some semblance of history that is still, still there, even with the street name. My family was one of the first families, if not the first, to move into Lee Walker Heights with my grandfather and my grandmother and my father. And uh, if you ever return to Asheville and you don't see Lee Walker Heights anymore and you don't see your history anymore and the street's gone, it's almost like it was erased from history. And so that was my neighbor. I'm not ready to, to let go of every piece of the history that, that is good, bad, all of it. It's still history. Thank you. And if I can make a comment okay. following, that's the same exact thing I brought up during public safety, um, which caused a minor delay because I wanted to make sure that the developer reached out to the community and consulted about the name change. Um, I, I know I've seen t-shirts um, from the community member because they're really holding um, that the community and a lot of the memories of the community to heart and I didn't want a, a street name change to be a small small indicator that there may be a possibility of displacement that they won't be able to return because there are those subtleties like that that can cause um, a, a, a lot of perception so I do I do feel you um, Keith my family also grew up Lee Walker Heights um, from its very beginning. And Lee Garden Lane is uh, a name that was chosen by the community to commemorate um, the name Lee Walker and also a garden that was very beautiful at the base of um, Lee Walker Heights. So Lee Garden was actually um, in, um, endorsed by a lot of the community members. But I, I do understand um, Wilbur Avenue will always be near and dear to a, a lot of us. Thank you. Okay, we will do the public hearing C, public hearing to consider the rezoning of 990 Sweeten Creek Road from industrial district to commercial industrial district. And Sasha? Good evening, Council. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm here to present this re rezoning request for 990 Sweeten Creek Road. This 0.33 acre parcel is currently zoned industrial. It's here at the intersection of Sweeten Creek Road and Sweeten Creek Industrial Park. Um, so it's a pretty small parcel. It has a small commercial building on it. As you can see here on the south of this blue line is industrial and to the north is commercial industrial. So the proposed rezoning is CI for this parcel. And you can see it has access from both streets, you know, driveways that access both streets. Industrial allows a very few number of uses. So it has really restricted this property owner's use. And so they've made this request. In our new comprehensive plan, Living Asheville, we look at the future land use map, and for both CI, commercial industrial, and in industrial, it is categorized the same way. So it does not require any kind of map amendment to our future land use plan. Um, the commercial industrial zoning would widen the number of uses that are allowed on this, but not so much so that it would be out of character with the adjacent industrial land. So staff is fully supportive of this rezoning and the Planning and Zoning Commission voted six to zero in support of it as well. And I can take any questions. And any questions from council? Any comments? Did, do do we know what plan for this building would be? 
I, I believe the plan, um, again, obviously rezoning doesn't say what exactly it has right. to be, but I think she may be interested in opening maybe a small restaurant or something that would help the foot workers in this area, but it's not to demolish the building. It would be to keep the building that's there today. I mean, right now, it's a, it looks like a house when you drive by it. It and does. So, so if you drive by it, it's, yeah, it looks like a house, and I think they're running a, a, um, a house cleaning service out of it, Correct. if I'm not mistaken. So I mean, there's not much you can do with it, Brian. I mean, it's, the house looks like it's in good shape. It's not like you think they'd knock it down, but it's, I mean, it is right across, the back behind there is the industrial park, and you know, right across from that, I think there's like Blossom and Gas. There's, there's no residential aspect of this uh, by, by any means. And restaurant may be overstating it. I think it's more yeah. of a small kind of grab and go kind of thing. But. Any other questions, comments? I will open up the public hearing. I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Uh, I move to approve the rezoning request from industrial district to commercial industrial district, thereby assigning a zoning designation that is compatible with the surrounding properties and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest, and is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted plans in the following ways. The rezoning will, one, support the adaptive reuse of the existing structure, and two, will allow for a broader range of uses that will support and serve the surrounding businesses, employees, and residents. Do I have a second? Brian second. Brian seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. So now we will open up public hearing D, which is a public hearing to consider conditional zoning of property located at 20 Battery Park Avenue and known as the Flatiron Building from Central Business District to Central Business District Expansion Conditional Zone for the renovation of an existing building to include a restaurant, retail spaces, commercial office space on the second floor, and 71 lodging units on floors three to eight. So, Todd Ocolacini, please. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Todd Ocolacini, Planning and Urban Design Director. Uh, this meeting is a continuation of the May 14th Council meeting on the renovation of the historic Flatiron Building. Uh, the public hearing from May 14th was continued today at the request of the applicant's uh, attorney in order to allow the applicant to have further dialogue with the community about the proposal. The peti petition is a rezoning request via conditional zoning from Central Business District to Central Business District Expansion Conditional Zone due to the lodging use which is a prohibited use uh, within that zoning district. The uses proposed have been revised from the previous submittal uh, and now include 71 lodging guest rooms reduced from the 80 guest rooms of the original proposal and a floor of office space which was previously not included. The proposed retail and restaurant spaces would remain on the ground floor and there is also the small rooftop addition that was part of the original proposal for the project. Uh, streetscape improvements proposed along Battery Park Avenue, if you recall, uh, include the conversion of six uh, existing on-street spaces that were formerly located here, uh, and a conversion of those spaces to one ADA accessible space and one enlarged loading zone. Uh, the applicant has proposed to donate the $2 per occupied room per night in perpetuity to the city to offset the lost revenue from the parking spaces that would be removed. And that figure does not take into consideration inflation for future years. The city would also grant a license agreement to the applicant at fair market value of the new loading zone so that it may be used exclusively by the applicant for hotel, hotel valet parking. The use of the loading zone has changed to the exclusive use for the hotel at, at, uh, per staff's recommendation. So that is another change in this proposal. The applicant is requesting several conditions, um, including the provision of the loading zone, which would otherwise not be permitted on a key pedestrian street, which is identified as Battery Park Avenue. The zoning code requires that guest drop-off areas be located at the interior of the site and not along the primary access corridor. Uh, obviously, this is an existing uh, condition uh, due to the Flatiron Building. The uh, minimum of 36 parking spaces are, are not being met on the site for the lodging use. However, the applicant cannot comply to the reuse, again, of the existing building. 
uh, and off-site spaces will be secured at various locations uh, throughout downtown. The applicant has also submitted documentation for an updated uh, traffic and parking analysis for the change to some of the, uh, the office use of the building. Uh, it still indicates that uh, the parking and vehicular trip generation for the uses overall would still be less than the current office uses for the uh, Flatiron building. Uh, finally, the last condition is along Wall Street that the sidewalk does not meet the minimum sidewalk width of 12 feet and existing materials do not comply with accessibility standards. Again, this is an existing condition. Uh, staff finds that the public benefits of the project, including the needed life safety upgrades, the overall rehabilitation and preservation of the iconic historic building in downtown, and streetscape enhancements, coupled with the conditions proposed by the applicant that minimize um, some of the impacts stemming from the change of use, outweigh any of the staff concerns, and we still recommend approval of the project. Uh, with that, that concludes <coughs> my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, I have some. Yes. Um, so you, you described this, uh, our previous meeting ending in a continuation um, when, if I remember correctly, it uh, ended with the applicant withdrawing their application. Um, which, in the way I understand things, when they withdrew their application, they should have repeated the application process, going back to committee, uh, and it does not seem that this happened, um, and I don't understand why. So I was hoping to hear an explanation. Sure, and, and you know, again, after um, there was some confusion, I think, at that meeting, I think uh, the applicant's attorney uh, did, did use that, that word withdrawal, uh, but he had also indicated that his intent was to go back uh, and meet with the community to discuss the project. Uh, again, after kind of watching the video and, and checking in with the applicant's uh, attorney, the, the intent of that conversation was to was to continue the, the project to allow that further community dialogue. Um, that's the way staff interpreted that that conversation. We actually don't have a formal process um, in our UDO for an applicant to withdraw, uh, but we do allow typically that that continuation uh, of a project. So my, uh, I I don't see it the same way staff was seeing it there, uh, and had they requested a continuation would we not have had the right then to just call for a vote and not allow this continuation uh, I, I where, think where where they were we are obligated to accept their withdrawal of application but not a continuation i, I think typically when um, an applicant requests a continuation we would typically ask them to set a date certain uh, which again did not happen at that may 14th meeting uh, but certainly it's um, you know up to council can at that May 4th, 14th meeting, did have the option of not allowing the applicant to, to continue the, you know, the application um, and, or withdrawal. There certainly could have been a vote still you know, on the application as, as it stood on that date. I, I was not under the impression that we had a, a choice at that time, that if they withdrew their application, that we had to accept that. Uh, had I known it was asking for a continuation, I would have gone for, for a vote there. Yeah, I apologize all, for that confusion. I'm quite disappointed in the way that this moved back to council so quickly. Any other questions for Todd? Yeah, I, I just would note on this point that something very similar happened with another hotel project here on Biltmore Avenue where right. the same, same thing happened. So it's not as if we're changing our process. <laughs> uh, I can understand, you know, certainly Council Member Haynes, could have, we could have called for a vote, could have been voted down, could have been voted up. Uh, that didn't happen, and so we're here. And, and going forward to you know, fool us once, fool us twice, um, in terms of the, the language used for withdrawal, um, we'll, we'll make a note from staff next time to make it very clear if, if that wording is used uh, at a council meeting and, and make council members and the public aware exactly what the applicant is, is requesting. Does the applicant want to come forward? Madam 
Madam Vice Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor on the telephone, members of council, thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to come back. Uh, to Councilman Haynes, my apologies uh, for any confusion I created with the words that I, that I used, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll be brief. At the last council meeting, I think it went on for almost four hours. We heard uh, from voices on all sides of this issue, some in favor, some against, some more or less neutral, but wanted their voices to be heard. But there was one common theme, and that is that the Flatiron is an iconic, important building, and we need to preserve it. Councilwoman Mayfield said, I'm going to ask you to do something that developers don't often do. I want you to sit down with your opponents. I want you to sit down uh, with other voices around the table, experts in the field of um, historic renovation, experts in the field of real estate development, people who understand financing of projects of this nature. I want you to do that and see if you can do what we have often done in Asheville uh, when we gather different voices together, try to collectively come up with the best decision uh, for the Flatiron Building. And so we did that. Over the last six weeks, we had meetings, telephone calls, emails, more meetings, more telephone calls. We met with uh, folks that, that understand the history of this building from even before it was purchased by Midtown Development Group in 1985. We met with folks like Doug Ellington, uh, whose uh, name is associated with a lot of the famous architecture in the city. We met with uh, bankers, people that understand finance. We asked, uh, are there any white knights out there? Is there, is there any philanthropist that's willing to uh, put the necessary money up to purchase, preserve, and protect this building? We asked that question of several people. We asked, is there a bank willing to lend the money necessary to protect and preserve this building? No white knight came forward and no bank stepped up and offered to lend money to keep this uh, building as commercial office space. Along the way, uh, there were uh, some questions raised about uh, the, the figure, the estimated amount that we got from Beverly Grant of $10.5 million that it would take to protect and preserve this building. Uh, one, one architect in town, uh, as, as recently as Friday, I believe, said, well, you know, you don't really have to have a sprinkler system. And that's true. Uh, the building currently is grandfathered. It does not have to have a sprinkler system. But if you're going to do the kind of renovations that you need to do to protect and preserve that building long term, you will need a sprinkler system. And I can tell you right now that if Philip Wolcott and his team, if they're associated with this project, this building will have a sprinkler system because it's the right thing to do, whether it's required or not. It will also have an ADA accessible elevator. That would be required, and it's also the right thing to do. It needs a new HVAC system. It needs substantial upgrades to the plumbing system. It needs an entirely new electrical system. As I told you before, it has the original electrical system from the 1920s. That's dangerous, that's a fire hazard, and it needs to be upgraded. What we heard, uh, well, well, so in these meetings, we said, is there anything else? I mean, is there any reason to second guess or question uh, the figure that we're talking about, over $10 million? And there, were, there was silence. The 10 million, 10.5 million is a solid number. Chris Smith from Beverly uh, Grant is here. He's, he's got uh, detailed figures to back that up if any of you have any questions about it. But through all of our meetings and calls and emails, no one seriously challenged that number. The biggest concern we heard in our meeting uh, in our meetings, our telephone calls, and we heard it from the beginning that we launched this project all the way through uh, and, and, and as recently as last week. Well, what about the loss of commercial office space? As I told you before, in fact, there is ample commercial office space in downtown Asheville. The Jackson Building, the Adler Building, the Legal Building, that's comparable space, still available. 
I have a developer client who is proposing a significant mixed-use project on the South Slope, and they are contemplating as much as maybe 40,000 square feet of commercial office space. There's, there's ample commercial office space, but what we heard again and again was, yes, but it's the Flatiron Building, and there's always been office space in that building. And so we were asked, we were asked uh, through these meetings, and we were asked throughout the project by various people, is there any way you can save commercial office space in that building and still do what needs to be done to protect and preserve it? And we went back to the drawing board on that as well. And as you can see from the proposal, the Flatiron Preservation Group has concluded that they could save an entire floor of office space and still make the project work financially. It's not easy. Significant loss of revenue go from 80 down to 71 rooms. They got to, had to change their pro formas. It wasn't something they just decided overnight. It took days of number crunching of can we do this? Philip and his partner spent uh, some sleepless nights trying to figure out how to make the numbers work. But what they decided was this building and this project is worth it and that the project will be better. It will be better for preserving a core part of what it has always been, and that is commercial office space. They had already agreed to preserve retail space on the main level, which will happen, and which will be uh, earmarked for local businesses. People have asked me, well, what are, are, are local businesses going to be able to occupy the commercial space when it's renovated? And the answer is, we certainly hope so, because my clients want this to be a true, authentic Asheville project one that we can all be proud of. You could imagine that the massage therapists that are in there now would, would be thrilled to come back in. That sort of business would be very complimentary uh, with, a, with the lodging use that we're contemplating. You could imagine that uh, professionals, uh, the solo practitioner lawyers, the therapists and so forth would, be, would love to be in this building. It, would be, it could be, become part of their brand that they would be associated with this building. So we're confident that local businesses will flood back in uh, and will be fighting over that space and it will make it uh, a truly spectacular building. And at the end of this project, it will be restored, it will be safe, it will be accessible and it will be there for future generations at no cost to the city of Asheville. What hasn't changed from this project? They're still gonna collect $2 per room per night. The present value of that over 20 years is over half a million dollars. The difference in the property tax revenue for the city, present value, $2.1 million that this city absolutely needs. They will employ more than 30 people they will be a living wage certified business. They're committed to that. They're, they have already reached out to Green Opportunities. They hope to use this as a training ground for employees that can their work, work their way up uh, through the system. Local owner, local architect, local contractors. This is not a chain hotel. This is an authentic Asheville hotel, which is what this building deserves. The decision to approve this project is the right thing to do. Now, I opened the paper this morning. I was out of town last weekend. I opened the paper and I saw Councilman uh, Haynes uh, said, well, we, we've learned this new information about one of the owners, a gentleman named Marshall Canner. We have questions about him and his criminal background. Well, I've read the same things you all have uh, that Andrew Fletcher found on the internet. And evidently, Mr. Canner is a convicted felon. He served time, and he's now out of prison. He is a minority owner of Midtown Development Associates, LLC. He is not a manager of that LLC, and he is not a manager of the Flatiron Project. He is a minority passive owner. That fact, with all due respect, is totally irrelevant to the issue before you as to whether to approve a conditional zoning request. It's legally irrelevant factually irrelevant to. And I would suggest to you that if it bothers you, and that him, criminal history bothered me when I read it, then you should vote in favor of this project because if the Flatiron Preservation Group is, receives this conditional zoning and is able to close on this project, Mr. Canner will have no involvement in it whatsoever. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. 
Um, thank you. Thank you. I do have questions oh, if no do one you, else does. Do yes. Of the applicant? Of the applicant. Okay. Before you do that, do you mind if I ask Brad to just refresh us on what kind of factors that we should consider around land use and zoning changes and then also address, um, there was also a, an earlier article in the paper suggesting the city had put some money into this project um, and what work has been done for that and then Uh, absolutely, Madam Vice Mayor and members of council, um, <clears throat> to your first question regarding what factors can be considered. Uh, as council knows, any land use decision is a legislative one. Uh, it is one made by the council based upon certain factors which are prescribed by state law. Um, North Carolina General Statute 160A-383 provides the authority for council to make these decisions and pers uh, specifically prescribes the factors to be considered are whether or not the proposed plan is consistent with our approved area plans, whether or not the proposed use is reasonable and in the public interest. That is the limited factors which can be considered pursuant to the state statutes. Uh, some relevant case law which could also be considered uh, and should be kept in mind as a limiting factor are that the case law suggests that your decisions should be based on a regulation of the use of the property not of specific activity or ownership of the property. And that encompasses primarily what is listed in both the state statutes and relevant case law with regard to your decision-making process. Can you read the part where you said reasonable? Absolutely. Again, uh, Councilman Young, this comes from the uh, general statutes 160A-383. The three primary factors which council must make a decision upon are that the plan is either or not consistent with the approved area plans, number one. Number two, that the proposed uh, rezoning is reasonable. And number three, that it is in the public interest. And how do you define reasonable? That specifically is not further defined in the statutes. Uh, there are certain cases which deal with that, but that is left up to a certain amount of discretion on the legislative body. So would that be considered subjective? To a certain extent, yes. Thank you. So, go ahead. so yeah, I, I've got some questions. Um, based on what we just heard, at the um, May 14th meeting, uh, the applicant was asked how long he owned the building uh, by Councilman Haynes. And the reply was about 33 years. Uh, Councilman Haynes then asked a question about deferred maintenance. And he stated that it seemed to be a lot of issues that we're hearing about deferred maintenance, which we've actually heard again here tonight, uh, about you know what what was the deferred maintenance? And before the applicant could answer, uh, you had said the project has not cash flowed enough to perform maintenance, and the applicant then said it takes too much money to do the maintenance. I'm curious as to once the ownership began in the property um, in, is it 19, 1985 or 19? 1985, I believe. 1985. What was the immediate maintenance schedule on the building shortly thereafter, if the applicant could, could answer that question? So I represent the Flatiron Preservation Group, the prospective buyer of the property. I don't represent Russell Thomas. I don't represent Midtown Development Group, LLC, the seller in this matter. Okay. I, I don't know whether Mr. Thomas is here. I didn't see him come in and he could address that. From the public records, and you and I emailed about this this afternoon, uh, it appears that um, a general partnership called Midtown Development Associates uh, purchased the property in 1985. There was some question raised in, the, in uh, Joel Burgess's newspaper article referencing a a New Citizen Times article from that time frame questioning whether there was bond money. It is my understanding from talking with Mr. Thomas that the Flatiron Building and Midtown received zero dollars from the city, zero dollars from, uh, from any governmental source. They borrowed money according to the deed of trust that I emailed you this afternoon. They borrowed $600,000. 
I don't know whether they borrowed any more than that. I didn't have a chance to check the public record this afternoon. And I don't know what their uh, specific maintenance schedule was. I do know this. Um, so in, in, the, in talking to various folks over the last six weeks, um, one of the things we learned was that that building had, uh, according to the broker, Chuck Tessier, who was involved in the sale, it had a 10% occupancy rate in 1985. It was in bad shape. According to what Mr. Thomas has told me, it required a lot of work to get it into shape so that he could even rent it again and open it back up uh, to commercial tenants. Uh, so it's a, it's a fair question uh, about the maintenance and, and what was their schedule. My understanding, though, from talking to Mr. Tessier, who certainly knows and has uh, and he emailed uh, uh, Councilwoman, uh, uh, and, uh, I think all, all, uh, Mayfield and perhaps others, I, I know that he sent one to her, uh, where he explained this history and he talked about the condition that it was in and the challenges that it faced back then. I suspect that the money they borrowed went into acquisition and simply getting it back up to speed. Um, long answer to your question, um, but, but I, I, I really think when you look at the numbers since then, it, it is, it, it, the building has enabled uh, Mr. Thomas to make a living, uh, but he works every day to keep that building together. Uh, he understands every aspect of it. You heard him describe that before. Uh, we can sit here in 2019 and second guess whether uh, he and his partners could have invested more into the building over the years, but that, that issue is behind us. And right now you have, uh, a, a, you have a development group my client who is prepared to buy this building and put the necessary money in to fix it up in the way that it needs to be fixed up. So I would, I have a few more questions and, and I, I wouldn't necessarily 100% agree with the issues behind us because on the May 14th meeting and tonight, what we've heard was part of the reason we should do this, part of the reason we should approve this building is because of the deferred maintenance. And on May 14th, when Councilman Haynes asked about the deferred maintenance, no answer was given. The, the, the representative, not yourself, but of the, of the group that actually owns the building was here front and center to answer all questions. Uh, he doesn't seem to be here tonight. And again, the question of maintenance, you're telling us we should do this because of maintenance. But again, the question of what was the maintenance schedule on the building has not been answered again. And so that raises questions on my part when in fact you I've in light of the recent information that has come before us um, we have the newspaper clippings and we have the things that state that there possibly was some funds given I, I remember somebody saying at the last meeting if the city wants to change the use of the building we should stroke the check and then there's information that possibly a check was written to do work you're saying that it wasn't um, but the information that I have from the city attorney's office and I'll read it wasn't confidential so I'm going to read it uh, while we have been able to locate the original memorandum of understanding between the city and Sunbelt which is the previous owner the resolution authorizing the memor that memorandum of understanding as well as the third amendment to the memorandum of understanding which we do have a copy of and which is attached suggests that the focus of the Wall Street redevelopment project was on the construction of the Wall Street parking deck, the repaving of Wall Street, and the performance of smaller scale improvements to the Anderson building and the Flatiron building. Given that the Sun Belt conveyed the Flatiron building to Midtown shortly before the start of the Wall Street redevelopment project, and given that there is no separate agreement between the city and Midtown, it seems likely that if work was in fact performed on the Flatiron building, it was likely performed by Sunbelt pursuant to the memorandum of understanding between the city and Sunbelt. Although we do not know what work on the Flatiron building was planned or if it was ever performed, we have confirmed through a title search that no deed or use restrictions were placed on the Flatiron building in relation to the Wall Street redevelopment project of the mid 80s. So what that tells me is there was some money somehow exchange to do some sort of work on this building whether the city was a pass-through or not and based on our conversations through email this afternoon you stated yourself you haven't yet reviewed the title to see if they borrowed any money any money on that building other than the six hundred dollars that was in the deed of trust in 1985 
So what I'm getting at is if in fact there was money given to do maintenance on this building, I would like to know what maintenance was done back in 85 and what was the schedule pursuant to that moving forward, especially if you're standing in front of us saying we should do this because of deferred maintenance. And I quote earlier, you said, this is a historic building. It must be preserved. Uh, there was no white knight to help preserve the building. Well, the city tried to preserve the building. It looks like possibly, I can't be sure, in 1985. And I would like to know what the maintenance schedule was moving forward, but we don't know that. In light of not knowing that, and, not, and, and the, the newspaper said that the city possibly gave almost a million dollars. We can't necessarily verify if we even did that. There are questions that'll be raised. I am not comfortable moving forward with this without those questions being answered, without questions being answered if there was money given to the group prior to the, uh, or, or arranged prior to the, 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 uh, the group that you represent taking control of the building, what maintenance was done, what the maintenance schedule was, and why the building is in such disrepair to where it falls on city council that we must rezone this building in order for it to stay afloat. What, isn't that the owner's responsibility moving when he got the building? He, I mean, I want people to make a profit off of their buildings. I mean, uh, you know, he purchased the building, his group purchased the building for $440,000 back in the 80s. 100% return on that is just under, what, a million dollars? What is, and I think the, the purchase price is probably gonna be somewhere around 16 million. That's probably like a 30, 350, no? 3,500% increase on return investment. And if you didn't do, if you're standing here asking us to approve this because the building is gonna crumble, that, we need those answers. I, I need to know if the city actually did put money in this project and if maintenance was done and if what, what the maintenance was. So what I'm gonna ask for is a continuance to move forward to get those answers. Not that we're gonna vote it up or down, but to at least get those answers before we make such a critical decision, especially since the leg that the applicant is standing on is, you gotta pass it or the building is gonna fall. If that's the case, and if we do decide to pass it, I at least wanna know what the maintenance schedule was and what happened to the money, if there was any money. And we don't have definitive answers. If I may. Sure. Uh, Councilman Young, I, I listened carefully to everything that you got from the city attorney, and he's here to explain what he said. What I heard was a little bit different than what you heard. What I heard was- Well, I actually read what he wrote. Right. What I understood as a lawyer was maybe different than what you understood as a layperson. Okay. What I heard and understood as a lawyer was that there is nothing in the chain of title and there is nothing in the city archives to suggest that the city of Asheville or any governmental authority gave money to the entity that has owned this building for the last 33 years. No evidence. Well, we At, have a memorandum of understanding. That is with a predecessor in title. And then in, the, in what I read. May he finish? May he finish? He's, he's trying to answer your question. All right, we're having a conversation no, here. Well, per, no, per he's trying to answer your question. You're cutting him off. Well, you cut me off all the time, but that's different, I guess. Okay. <laughs> what, 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 what you read, and, and, and I would ask Mr. Branham to clarify in case I misheard it. But what you read is that that amendment, which I haven't read, uh, states that money went to a predecessor in title. That's very different, very legally importantly different than going to the entity that you are um, critical of for not maintaining the building in your view over the last 33 years. Very different. I would suggest, knowing what I know, because I was in high school at the time, uh, that area of town needed a lot of help. There was money used to build a Wall Street parking deck. There was money used to improve Wall Street. I'm not aware of any evidence to suggest that the Flatiron received any improvements during the period of time that Midtown Development Associates, a general partnership which included Russell Thomas, uh, during the period of time that they owned it. Mr. Thomas assured me as recently as yesterday when I talked to him. Uh, that they received no such money. There's no evidence to suggest they did. And I would say, even if there were, and there isn't, but even if you, you dug some more, and, and you, what relevance, I would ask, does that have to a rezoning decision in June of 2019? With all due respect, it is not legally or factually relevant. Was that a rhetorical question, or would you like me to answer it?
I was just asking, was that rhetorical or did you want me to answer? Uh, I, I, Councilman Young, with, with all due respect, I'm simply stating my position. Okay. So I will ask for a continuance. Uh, we can vote that up or down, or if I don't have a second on it, or whenever we get to that point, I don't think there's any definitive documented information that shows such. Uh, I would like that exhausted before I actually make a vote. And that is where I stand. Is that, is is that, that a motion? motion? No, that's not a motion. That, those, are, those are just comments. Uh, if that is the case, I would like to make a motion to continue the hearing uh, to an earlier, to a later date, where we could actually get definitive answers on these questions. Councilman Young, if I may, uh, pursuant to the rules, the, um, the the correct motion I believe that you're trying to make is a motion to postpone consideration okay. under our rules, and I do have a, a form motion for council's consideration on that. Will, will there just will there be discussion on this motion after it's made? Do you ability to have discussion on the motion? This would be um, a procedural motion council. and not a substantive one, which means there is no necessity to have any public uh, discussion on that. Council can consider this motion based upon standard majority vote. Right. I yeah, move all pursuant all to Rule 19H of the Asheville City Council Rules of Civil Procedure to postpone consideration of the motion considering the conditional zoning request for the Flatiron Building from Central Business Dist District to Central Business Expansion District, CBD, EXP, CZ, to the next regular meeting of the City Council on July 23rd, 2019 at 5 p.m. so that Council may have adequate time to consider all relevant information prior to a uh, final vote. Second. So I have a motion and a second to uh, any discussion? So yes, there is no discussion on a, well, on a procedural well, motion. Well, it, you know. there is no required public uh, oh, comment. Public, yeah. My apologies. Just, excuse me, council yes. members. Yes. Um, so, so just just two 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 quick questions on here. Um, so, uh, this is directed to the um, to the city attorney, um, council member Young has has has, uh, has been discussing some of the concerns about um, potential uh, city city dollars being used for that. Um, you have found no evidence of of, of that occurring. It's also referred to the issue of deferred maintenance. You started this conversation about what we may or may not consider. My question is, is, is are either, either of those um, uh, relevant considerations to the use decision that we've got to make tonight? With, with regard to your first question, I, I will say that the memo that uh, Councilman Young read was correctly read, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that. I, I believe it's important to state that uh, at this point, our focus as a city attorney's office was to determine whether or not any land use restrictions or security interests from any previous uh, potential uh, donation, uh, grant, or bond money existed on this property such that it would be relevant to any consideration by council tonight. We have determined definitively at this point, I believe, that that is not the case. Uh, we cannot say specifically what arrangement did occur with detail. The documents simply do not exist at this point that we're able to discover. Uh, what we can say is that there were arrangements with a predecessor of interest to do some work in the area. We cannot speak exactly to what that scope was at this point. Uh, with regard to your second question, um, I, I would say that um, previous uh, monies at this point uh, that were expended likely were spent on a construction project uh, per the memo involving the construction of the parking deck that's adjacent to the property and some additional infrastructure and streetscape improvements that may or may not have included some uh, limited tie-in work to the buildings uh, including the Flatiron building. Um, at this point I do not believe that there are any land use restrictions or security interest that would weigh on any decision you would make tonight. And, and I can't remember, Councilman Kapoor, what was your second question? So, so, so it, was, it was the more important one. Uh, so it, it was the question of, and I'll put you on the spot here, we're talking about deferred maintenance, right? We're basically, the argument is basically like, look, they didn't, they didn't upkeep the building, right? And so now we're here. And so, so my question to you is, you know, you've, you, and I'm putting you on the spot here and I realize it, um, that's why we brought you along. Uh, in, in terms of, of whether that is a relevant consideration of use, of use of the building, even if we were to postpone this and find out this information, even if it were to be true, um, is that a legitimate factor uh, in the consideration of whether or not to approve or disapprove this conditional zoning request? 
Uh, and Councilman, again, this as, as a legislative determination, there's a certain amount of subjectivity that the council should be able to consider. Uh, I would say from a purely legal standpoint that I have not seen anything in the search that my office has performed that I would believe that would rise to the level of a legal factor to be considered under the statute as read. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion from council on deferring the Postponement of postponement, consideration. Okay, so I have a <clears throat> motion and a second to postpone consideration to a certain date, a day certain. Uh, so all those in favor of delaying, let's raise your hand so that we, I've got three. And all those opposed? Esther? Um, uh, yeah, I'm on the, can you guys hear me? Yes. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. I am opposed to the motion. Okay, so that motion does not pass. Any, any other questions before I sit down? Okay, so the, are we ready to open this up to? So I'm gonna open up the public hearing. So, but first, I'm gonna go over the rules. Uh, e each person has three minutes, unless you have three other people that will give up their time and not speak on the same issue. If you do have three people and they raise their hands and indicate that, then the person has 10 minutes. Um, you've heard the, the discussion about relevant information that council can consider, so I would ask you to Think about that when you're commenting on this issue. And again, no clapping, no hissing, no, just try to be quiet so that we are able to hear all of the speakers. Maggie, do we have anybody downstairs? Okay, so there's no one on the first floor. Um, so we, so Mr. Nutter, you will show us how this works and everyone will follow your great lead. Now, and, and again, I'll tell you the rules again. The green light says go, the yellow light says you're getting near the end, and the red light is stop. Thank and you, I ma'am. suspect that there will be a lot, a, a lot of comment on this, so I will ask that you stop when you see the red light. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am David Nutter, and I would like very much to encourage you to vote yes uh, at this evening's reconsideration of a significantly improved Flatiron Building Hotel conditional zoning. <clears throat> I believe the developer's change to the project, which reserves this, <clears throat> excuse me, which reserves the second floor for office and small business use is a positive step forward and one that is in keeping with the spirit and forward direction of Asheville. I believe that we are a mountain tourist economy community with limited real estate markets and ph philanthropic interests, and that we need to work with that destiny which we have to make it better, hopefully very much better. I think the improved Flatiron Project with its enlightened and voluntary change can serve as a way station for learning how to do that. As I see it, the developer's voluntary change represents some sacrifice for the proposed project, one with less revenue to support reinvestment in this heritage and beautiful building, but one in the very best interest of the Asheville community that we love. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor, um, yes. I see that we've continued on with public comment, but there is no motion on the floor to open it to public comment. Yes, Keith made, so I need more clarity. Okay, so um, for a public hearing, we don't get a motion until after we hear all the public hearings. Um, and he, uh, Councilman Young's was a procedural that, that okay. we didn't open up for public hearing. I get it. And, but tell me if I'm messing up. Th th that's up. correct. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Casey Campfield. Uh, your vote today is going to demonstrate very clearly who you are representing. Developers, hoteliers, 
or the rest of Asheville. It's pretty clear. Uh, people have said over and over again that they are not interested in more hotel development at this time. I think it is a good time for us all to stop and take our breath. We have, in addition to all the hotels that we have in the downtown and the surrounding areas, we have 16 that have been approved or under, currently under development. That's 16 more in addition to the ones we already have. Um, and that's a lot. This is also not a hotel that's going to be developed on an empty plot on Tunnel Road. You know, this is a hotel in the middle of downtown with all the logistical concerns that come with that. It's a hotel that provides for no additional parking. This is a hotel that will displace 70 local businesses. Um, so who are you going to represent tonight? The hoteliers and the developers or the rest of Asheville? One of the factors that uh, city attorney said could be considered is the public good and the public interest. And the public, when asked over and over again, has said they are not interested in another hotel at this time. I don't think that's an extreme position to take. We are inundated. We are overwhelmed. We need a little space, and we need a little time for this town to develop other options, small businesses, housing, transit. We need other things to be happening right now. This deluge of hotel development is not currently in the public interest. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. My name is Abby, and I'm the Spoon Lady. Um, there are certain things in Asheville that kind of remind us where we are. Um, you know, we have bicycle taverns and big purple buses and all sorts of stuff. But the thing that makes Asheville Asheville is <coughs> the people that live here. Our artists, our musicians, folks like that. The more and more Asheville grows, the more and more we're losing them. Our festivals and our venues are paying less and less. Our sidewalks are getting smaller and smaller. And people are moving away, including myself. This will be my last summer here. You asked him to talk to who is important. He never talked to us. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dan March. My company, uh, Environmental, uh, Pisgah Environmental, rented an office in Flatiron Building for several months. In my observation is the building is an inexpensive place for small businesses, professional businesses primarily. Today the rents are about $3 a square foot per month. And when comparable properties are $5 to $15 per square foot per month. In effect, the owners have invested in small businesses by offering offices at reasonable rates for over 30 some years. This has been a long-term business model. And Asheville has for many years benefited from um, the fostering of new and enduring businesses of therapists, engineers, architects, artists, insurance agents, web designers, and many more professionals who inhabit the Flatiron Building today. And looking around, I can see several engineering folks and insurance agents that I know who, work, who have offices there now. So likely the number of small businesses that the Flatiron Building has fostered over the last 30 some years is comparable to that of the wonderful record of Mountain BizWorks. Basically, the Flatiron Building owners have paid forward um, their share of goodwill in the public interest for many years. My opinion is they should not be bound to forever continuing as a business incubator. So um, buildings in Asheville are often repurposed. We can all think of gas stations that are now restaurants, warehouses that are microbreweries, and a number of other, other examples. 
So my opinion is that the Flatiron Building has served a very noble small business purpose for many years. It's time now for it to find another purpose in Asheville. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Elizabeth Shell, a downtown business owner. Um, I don't think the developers really heard what Julie Mayfield, the council person, asked. Uh, I think she asked them to talk to the people who were expressing concern about this project, and they didn't come, as Abby, uh, the spoon lady, spoke, they didn't come and talk to any of us. Um, I don't think they really care. The only real change in the pro proposal is to reduce the number of hotel rooms from 80 to 71. I suppose they think that adding back some as yet undefined business space, um, this little shiny, they like to offer the shiny, they think that uh, us simple Asheville folk will forget about what we actually had expressed over and over again, that we did not and we do not want another hotel downtown, that we especially did not want and do not want a beloved historic building such as the Flatiron Building turned into yet another hotel. We do not want another hotel on Battery Park where there are already 10 other lodging facilities within less than a half mile radius and two hotels directly across the street as well as all these other hotels that are in process of being built. We did not and do not want another hotel that will not only bring more visitors to an already glutted marketplace, but also their cars, which still have not really been accounted for. My small downtown business, like many others, depends on this healthy mix of locals and tourists, but I would rather depend on my local customers than tourists that come and go, depending on the economy and what's the hot new destination. Downtown businesses need locals, and we are very quickly losing them. Um, not just because they're gonna, they've lost a lot of business al businesses already in the Flatiron that they went to because they raised their rent um, or were pressured to leave, um, but there's just there's less reason for people to want to come down or live here because it's basically the playground of people who don't live here. Um, the lawyers brought up uh, these things that you're supposed to be able to vote on. Um, I just hope that you will not be confused or tricked by these money men and their shiny things. You're not voting on whether you want to save the flat iron. You're voting on whether to turn it into a hotel. That's it. And this proposal does not reflect the council's thriving local economy vision. Um, and it goes against the interests of this community. Please vote no. Thank you. Yes, yes, Dana. Good evening, esteemed council. My name is Nina Tovish. Um, I'd like to address two points this evening. The first is the proposed new mix of hotel and office space, a reduction, as mentioned, from 80 hotel rooms to 71. It's just barely over a 10% reduction. And we don't really know the square footage and the number of businesses that would be accommodated on the second floor. It's hard to say what that might amount to. I would note that 71 hotel rooms require 71 full bathrooms. That's a tremendous amount of space devoted to plumbing. <laughs> uh, whereas in an office building, you have shared toilet facilities and they are not full baths, they are stalls and sinks, uh, take up much less of the square footage of uh, the space available. The amount of changes in renovation that amount to $16 million for a hotel involves much more interior work than moving to, say, upgrade to Class A or B office space. That's a really different proposition. The kind of things you have to do for wiring, for plumbing, and so forth for hotel occupancy are very different. Even if you were having, say, the, first, the top three floors of the building turned into residential space, whether it were owner apartments for rent or a condo of some sort, it would still not require the extensive renovation that's required to make 71 lodging units available. As you've heard from many others this evening and previously, the sentiment among residents is that additional hotel space is not what we're looking for in the a central business district. And I think the fundamental question we have to present to you this evening is, 
how many hotel rooms in the central business district is too many. Let's agree that there must be some number. There's some number of hotel rooms that's too many hotel rooms. So what number is that? And how will council determine that? Will it be listening to the voice of Asheville residents, your constituents, or not? And at what point will the character of downtown be irrevocably changed? Or will we have to wait for some economic cycle with a huge crash and a downturn, and when those hotel units end up being renovated and three quarters of the bathrooms ripped out and have it turned into condos or elder housing or who knows. Um, in terms of future use for this building in the long run, I believe Thank office you. space is the way to go. Green chair. You can, you can pull that up. Yeah. I'm Amber Banks. I'm a generational native, a community activist, and I'm currently homeless while on disability. Last meeting, there were many speakers opposed to the flat iron proposal, in fact, close to two hours worth of public comment. Even though the developers withdrew the proposal, we know that at least four of our council members also opposed Julie Mayfield, Brian Haynes, Gwen Whistler, and Keith Young. After just hearing the lawyer talk about That's not really true of Shanika. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. Anyways, after just hearing the lawyer talk about taking Julie Mayfield's previous advice and meeting with the opposition, things seem clear to me. The opposition is the public, and meeting with the public never happened. Instead, meetings with experts happened. This is a push to get what they want at all costs. We have heard that solutions haven't been offered, but that isn't the truth. A solution I would offer is having the TDA put forth funding towards this historic site. From their website, BC TDA has supported 39 community capital projects with 44 million in tourism pro product development fund grants. Their mission is to be a leader in the economic development of Buncombe County by attracting and servicing visitors, generating income, jobs, and tax revenues, which make the community a better place to live and visit. So here are some of my talking points about the current flat iron proposal, in which we know little has changed since the last one. Out of around 80 businesses, about 71 would be lost. The valley runs would be a public safety hazard. The limited street parking and congestion are already problematic. <laughs> Many other flat iron buildings around the nation have not been historically renovated by turning them into hotels. These local businesses keep the heart of downtown authentic and unique. The news of the illegal and shady dealings of one of the owners is very disturbing, as is the news of retaliatory rent increases against those who have spoken against the proposal for the flat iron. I, for one, have a few misdemeanors on my record, and I can't find housing because of it. We do not need more luxury boutiques, we do not need more hotel rooms, and we do not need more restaurants. We do need affordable rental spaces for local businesses. We do need higher paying jobs. We do need a fully functional transit. We absolutely do need as much truly affordable housing as our city and county can literally turn out. Please vote no. Thank you. Council members and mayor, uh, my name is Camille McCarthy and I am a co-chair of the Western North Carolina Green Party. We came before council the last time this building was brought up for rezoning and we maintain that you should vote no to this proposal regardless of the minor changes made to the proposal since it was introduced a few weeks ago. The people of Asheville have spoken up time and time again against approving more hotels. This hotel proposal in particular is symbolic of how our city has sold out to tourism and a high cost to locals. Regarding preserving the Flatiron Building, I'm gonna echo Amber's sentiment and say that this seems like exactly the sort of project the Tourism Development Authority could help with financially. Regardless, the community is tired of being ignored in favor of helping developers make more money. The reason people wanted 
these rezoning requests for hotels to go before council was precisely so that the public could have a say in the process. Your job is simple to listen to us and vote no on this hotel, as we have urged you to do today and a few weeks ago. If you do not vote no, we will have further proof that you do not care about the needs and wishes of Asheville's populace, only the needs and wishes of the hoteliers and developers. Thank you. Thank you. There was someone over. Yes. Um, <clears throat> my name is Farrell Zare, and I live on Battery Park. Uh, the developers have consistently and dramatically understated the congestion that this will bring to the area. One of the things they mentioned in the last uh, or previous portion of this meeting that there would be on, on any given day 312 vehicle trips in and out of the current office use. That would be the equivalent of between 30 to 40 people entering the, the office portion every hour. My wife and I counted one day on June the 5th, actually, how many people came into the building for, we counted for three and a half hours, starting at 745. And uh, there were only 34 people that entered the building. That's equivalent of 10 per hour, not 30 or 40 per hour. The other thing that is clearly inadequate is the loading area for our, the, for people to enter the building with their luggage and all that sort of thing. There's equivalent of one space across the street in a, in a hotel with half as many rooms. There's routinely between four and six people parked in the loading area. I see it every day. Um, finally, in the um, last uh, meeting, someone expressed that, you know, there were a lot of people that invest early in the revitalization of the city. And it, it only seems fair to let them benefit from that investment. Well, I, nobody disagrees with that as long as it's done in accordance with the zoning laws that apply. Um, you know, people like myself who have purchased subsequent to that time also deserve the benefit of the zoning laws. There are too many exceptions being made for this development, this property. Well, a lot of the things that they've said, well, we'll do this, and they really sound nice. They're great, but they aren't binding. And maybe somewhere down the road, maybe not too far away, some the developer will find these inconvenient, or some future owner will find them inconvenient or too expensive. And there's no way to guarantee that these things will be provided as suggested. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'll get you right after this one. Council members and mayor, my name is Patty Glazer. I have been practicing architecture out of my downtown office for 40 years. My firm, Glazer Architecture, has focused on renovating older and historic properties. We've received 26 Griffin Awards from the Preservation Society, and of these, 16 projects were renovated to the same Secretary of Interior standards as proposed by the developer and also qualified for the state and federal tax credits. Last week, I sent a letter to the city council members expressing some of my concerns with the proposed hotel conversion. However, given the three minute limitation, I'll focus on only a few of the key points. I am not convinced that the only way to save the building and bring it back to its quote unquote original glory is conversion to a hotel. I followed the comments from the developer, owner, city staff, and the public from various hearings. And in presentations by the developer and owner through their attorney, much information has been misrepresented, including the following. Item one, life safety. The developer and owner have indicated that a sprinkler system must be added for life safety. In reality, for building code compliance with 
the current North Carolina Commercial Building Code. I'm not talking grandfathered. A sprinkler is not required for the current use of offices. It is the conversion to hotel use with sleeping rooms that kicks in the sprinkler requirement. And I have uh, gotten concurrence from both local and Raleigh folks on that point. Item two, historic tax credits. I've confirmed with the State Historic Preservation Office that several points made by the developer have been misrepresented, including whether residential property is eligible to receive tax credits, as well as buildings that are partially income producing. Keeping the current use of leased retail and offices does qualify for the historic tax credit and not just the hotel conversion scenario. Item three, the Preservation Society's endorsement. And I realize Jack Thompson is here, but I don't think I'm misquoting. In their May issue of their newsletter, the, uh, in, they indicated that although they are concerned about the future sustainable use of the Flatiron, quote, stance on, the stance on the proposed Flatiron development, redevelopment has at times been misrepresented. We have not endorsed the plan for a hotel and have not taken a position on use, unquote. Uh, item four, the inevitable displacement of current office tenants. The developer has presented the inevitability that in the not too distant future, the current tenants would need to be displaced for renovations to occur. However, with careful planning and phasing, total vacant vacating of the building is not necessary. Item five, the numbers in the pro forma are not convincing without further breakdown. Thank you. Okay. If you want Thank to you. give, uh, if you want to give Maggie your written uh, comment. It's a little crossed off. Can That's, I if, email it or sure. in a neater format? Sure. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you need to do that at the beginning. In the back. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That I'll, the lady, the lady in glasses, you're next. Sorry. Good evening. My name is Peter Jimenez, and I represent the 25 or so tenants at the Haywood Park office complex. And I'm not here to say yes or no to be in favor or against this. I just ask that it does not, sorry, does not come at the expense of these tenants. Um, as mentioned before, there already is limited parking in downtown Asheville, and the proposal uh, for the Flatiron Hotel does um, say that six parking spaces will be taken away um, from Battery Park Avenue. And I do know that the, these tenants uh, do rely um, on the parking along Battery Park Avenue uh, for their business. Um, these are all local uh, business owners, and I know that they've been here for years, and they do rely on the local traffic that comes into downtown. They've worked a very long time to establish um, their clientele. And uh, the, for the second point, we do ask if you do um, pass this in favor um, to build the hotel, we do ask that there be no disruption of Battery Park Avenue. Um, a lot of these guests, um, sorry, a lot of these tenants um, have um, their, uh, their clients use the entrance at the Haywood Park Hotel, and a lot of them do pay um, out of their own park for, the, uh, for their clients to park and utilize the Haywood Park Hotel uh, valet. So, as I, yes, as I mentioned, uh, we just ask that you take into consideration uh, the tenants who are already there and that it not come at their expense. Thank you. Yeah. As I begin my three minutes, I want to briefly mention the 12.5% liability we could be into with one of the investors. Could you state your name, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Jan Zare. I think everyone knows now about that issue, and I hope that they're knowledgeable and that our city attorney will see to it that there are all of the funds that the city is involved in will be secure because of this. But regardless of the pending financial issue, my concern is the, the atmosphere of Asheville. I'm afraid that our city will fill with temporary guests who can afford expensive hotel rooms and expensive restaurants and we will remove those homeless people among us, many of them veterans, and that is happening now. The more hotels occupied by the wealthy, the more pressure to clean up the town, remove the vagrants, the veterans, the street people. These people are someone's child, were once our fighting soldiers, often a beloved grandparent. All are now on the, down on their luck and discarded as society's trash. 
My apartment overlooks Battery Park. I see people sleep as best they can on the sidewalk, read themselves to sleep with the light from a storefront. Many of these men and women are our children, our senior citizens, our displaced parents, and grandparents, all because of wages that don't keep up with housing costs, unexpected and uninsured medical emergencies, a divorce, a breadwinner's death, the list goes on ad infinitum. Let's enrich our town by converting the Flatiron Building into moderate housing, and businesses for that matter, offices, instead of luxury temporary guest facilities. Please don't let Asheville join the myriad of cities known for expensive hotels and restaurants caring only for those who can afford the big bucks. Homelessness, homelessness is not a choice. Too many luxury hotels is a choice. That is your choice. Are we a city dedicated to the, to riches, to the richest people or are we dedicated to all people? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Chris Smith. I'm one of the owners and vice president of Beverly Grant. Uh, as Wyatt mentioned, we would be the general contractor for the project. Um, we've worked on some of the projects that Ms. Glazier uh, just referenced that were awarded the Griffin Awards. Um, and I wanted to address a few of her, her points. Um, to my knowledge, as a general contractor, Ms. Glazier is correct about the sprinkler system not being required as the building currently sits and exists today. Um, that said, our experience is that the fire marshal is always the authority making the determination of if a renovation project, regardless of its type, will require a fire sprinkler system. We ran into this recently at 72 Patton Avenue, uh, not far down the street from this project, where it was an existing office space. There was a long-standing attorney there, uh, George Sanger's office, and that entity decided to retire, and we were hired to renovate their building to get it up to a Class A office standard. Um, the renovation logistics required that building to be fully vacated during the renovation, and one of the first things that the fire marshal's office told us when we submitted a pre-application for that project was that you're going to have to put in a fire sprinkler system. It is unsafe as it, as it exists right now. Um, so I think that should just be considered. I, certainly right now, at this present time, a fire sprinkler system is not required, but I do think that a significant renovation, even if it were just to create Class A office space, would result the need for a fire or sprinkler system to be added. The other thing I want to point out is if any of you have been part of a building where you are occupying the building trying to do your work, conduct your business at a profitable and acceptable level while construction work is going on. My desk has a phone on it. It rings all the time when we're in an occupied building. So yes, logistically, legally, could the building remain occupied while a renovation project was underway? It sure could. But the reality is those businesses are probably going to lose profitability during that time. And the safety of the workers when certain items like asbestos abatement, demolition, path of construction workers who understand how to safely navigate a site versus a, a lay person coming there for day-to-day -day, uh, business uh, would not be safe in my opinion. So please take those matters into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Did I see someone over on this side? Oh, I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> my name is Sarah Benoit. And I'm not going to repeat too much. I think we've had a lot of conversation tonight, um, and there's a lot of different things to think about. So I appreciate all of you and the work that you do to figure out the answer to these questions. I think for me, sitting here and listening, one of the things that's happened is I'm not clear about all the details. And I'm really disappointed that the motion to postpone did not go through. So for those of you who said no to that motion to postpone, um, I don't appreciate that. <laughs> I think we've had people stand up here who are experts who are saying different things. Um, and so I don't feel comfortable with the entire situation. And I think a lot of us feel that way. So I hope you'll consider that this is not a night where we should be voting yes on something that I feel is really muddy waters. Um, also, I just want to say that 
I think it's really sad that somehow, when I listen to all of you talk about your visions for Asheville, sometimes I get caught up on it and I feel like it's really beautiful and it's really amazing what you're trying to envision. But then when it comes down to holding something like a hotel, a developer, um, a property owner accountable for the way that they have done business and the way that they plan to do business, you basically ask us to just settle for whatever piece of crap we get thrown. So I don't appreciate a hotel standing up here and saying, we're gonna give you 30 jobs at living wage. Do you know what the living wage is in this city? It is BS. It's not even enough for those of us who make a living wage to barely live inside of our city. So why do they get points for that? Why do they get points for that? Um, why are we told that we shouldn't vilify developers and real estate agents just because we question whether or not they're actually contributing enough to our community? And when are at least three or four of you really going to start to understand that a lot of us don't feel like you are worried about the people who live here? You're worried about a few people who live here that somehow deserve to make all the money they can, every last squeezable million out of whatever they're doing, instead of being basically responsible. I mean, I just, I'm tired of being told that instead of a full meal, I should just take some scraps because somebody put in time a million years ago, supposedly to make the city a better place, but there's a lot of questions about how it's been going recently. And that just because a corporation is gonna come in and build something, they shouldn't have to actually go the extra distance. I think they deserve to have to go the extra distance. They're gonna make a lot of money off this city. They're gonna benefit a great deal from it. We should have not just living wage. I wanna see $15 an hour and more. I wanna see like we're helping you deal with the parking. We're gonna make sure the infrastructure around that area is not ruined. Why can't we ask for that? Why do three or four of you feel like we should accept that I just don't understand. So I hope you'll Thank rethink you. your position. Lucia. Susan Robbins, good evening. Council members have stated numerous times that hotel decisions will be made on a case-by-case -case basis. At the May 14th council meeting, at least four of you saw that the proposal to turn the Flatiron into a hotel was not in the best interests of the city. There has been no significant change since then. Yes, the developer has office, offered to keep one floor of office spaces, which would reduce the number of hotel rooms to 71. This change wasn't voluntary. It was necessary after the straw vote at the May 14th meeting. Oh, I lost my place. Um, and is no more than an attempt to sugarcoat the loss of a significant number of downtown office spaces and to draw your attention away from the fact that the issues with parking, garbage, congestion, pedestrian, and vehicular safety cannot be solved <coughs> in this particular location. The street you saw on that lovely drawing is not the street that we see <coughs> every day at all. This is not the right place for a hotel. In order to build this hotel, you have to override four requirements for conditional zoning contained in the Unified Development Ordinance. Staff has said that these requirements can't be met because the Flatiron is an existing building rather than new construction. I would argue they can't be met because this building in this location is not the right place for a hotel. You have adopted a vision. It states, thoroughfares are lined with thriving businesses mixed with residential and commercial units, uses. Our historic buildings are home to funky, eclectic businesses that reflect the character of the city and a creative economy of artists, makers, and innovators is thriving. You have adopted a comprehensive plan that says Living Asheville seeks to achieve a downtown that is livable and accessible to residents and visitors alike. Downtown would benefit from further growth and expansion of small businesses. You have adopted the UDO. You can't achieve your vision if you don't stick to your plan and uphold the code. The Flatiron Building should not be a hotel. 
please do not support this request for conditional zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, in the back. Hello. Uh, my Hello. name is Terrence Major, and I'll try to keep this short because most of these people have said everything that I've wanted to say. But obviously, as someone that lives here, uh, a hotel isn't the answer to helping Asheville whatsoever. Uh, it doesn't help build the community. Um, it's just furthering displacing people. Uh, we heard a presentation earlier where a cop was talking about gun violence and crimes, and the, the biggest thing that causes crimes is disparity in your community. People not being able to afford things, so what are they gonna do? They're gonna you know, go get it by whatever means. So uh, we should be spending our time just trying to actually build a community for the people that live here and stop talking about hotels. Thanks. Thank you. Is there someone in the back? I can't tell whether you're waving or, or lift, raising your hand, so. I drew this lovely picture of y'all. Um, y'all are great, um, regardless of how you vote, because we're all people. Um, back to the art thing. So I used to work at Jackson could, Underground could you Bakery. Say your, could you My say name is your, Eric Reyes. Thank you. I used to work at Jackson Underground Bakery, and I used to drive around in a moped handing out flyers, and that was fun. But I was terrible at it, and eventually I got fired. But it was mine to fail. Not only was it mine to fail, it was my shop owner's to fail because eventually she had to sell. She had to sell her bakery and then realizing that it's local, it's local failure. We get another chance and that's what I'm hoping we get because back then I was living illegally here in Asheville because the living wage is terrible but then I was living homeless and that was fun. I learned a lot and I worked on my art and it got me through. But I'm still clinging to living in Asheville, just barely. I make a lot more money than I used to, and it was really hard for a long time, but I'm stable now, and I want to, I want to stay stable because I feel like our love is getting commoditized. I feel like we are slowly veering to a more financially, a higher financial state of where our love should be going towards. Because if you focus on like the wealthy and the love they give, that's the love that's going to grow. But if you if you push away the love that you know poorer people have, and don't allow those people to grow, you're not allowing humanity to exist. And that humanity is Asheville, regardless of where you came from. I'm currently housing a homeless veteran of mine. We're going to move in into a three bedroom house soon. And he's cool, I, I, I like him, he's my friend. But my other friend, he's a tourist. He used to travel a lot. And he's trying to make the best he can here. He's got cat ears, he dances and does stuff here in Asheville. And that's the kind of growth I wanna see. A, a local enmeshment, not a um, cash grab. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy Kellum. I am a member of the CPAC committee. I'm about community. Um, and from what I hear, I'm a common sense type of person. Everyone's saying no to this hotel. Um, and I'm one for restoration. I love architecture, I love history. Um, and back again, uh, we don't need this hotel. We need, where's the love? Okay, since the gentleman just before me, where's the love? Where's the accountability that you guys have? Um, because you were voted into these positions. And the public, your people, my people, are depending on you to make the right decisions for us. Not for the tourists, because we're here all year long. We bear the burden of everything, um, just so the tourists can enjoy themselves when they come here. My first visits to Asheville was as a tourist, but now I understand both sides. 
Um, we're a beautiful community, um, and I believe we need to be discussing other more important matters, such as veterans, such as homelessness. I'm against homelessness, okay, because of beautiful people like him, because of disabled veterans, veterans who are homeless. Um, I have statistics, but we're not here to discuss this at this particular moment in time, but I will. Um, I'm just urging you again one more time. Um, the people say no to this, and I hope you will hear us clearly and say no to this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a out, about in the middle, I think you, right there, yeah. up on the screen yes if you put it on right <coughs> yep it, it'll take just a second okay <laughs> I just want to make sure okay there you go. go okay okay super and I do have three people I'm not going to speak for ten minutes okay. but I also would not like to be rushed I'm Kristen Daniels and who are my three people okay, okay. and you agree not to speak on this topic okay <laughs> Hello, City Council. I'm Kristen Daniels, and I'm firmly against this hotel and any other future hotels in downtown Asheville. This hotel might have been a good idea 10 years ago when there weren't wall-to-wall -wall hotels downtown, but that ship has sailed, and it is not our fault that the owner of this building wasn't on it. Just this week, Charlotte Magazine, from Charlotte, North Carolina, in an article about the perfect Asheville brewery crawl had this to say about where visitors from Asheville should stay. And I quote, downtown Asheville is full of hotels for all budgets. That's right, even the people in Charlotte agree that we are full of hotels, because we are. What this article doesn't mention, however, is that we are about to get fuller. In the downtown area alone, there are at least five more hotels not including the Flatiron Building, that are either under construction now or have yet to be started. And if we include the other hotels in the same category in and around Asheville, there are at least 13. Someone before me said 16, so we have at least 13. I put them all on here. Can I make it bigger or? No. Nope. Anyway, there are five, I'll, I'll read them real quick. There are five downtown. 100 rooms, 128 rooms, 83 rooms, 103 rooms, 56 rooms. Those are all yet to be on the market. In the Biltmore Village area, there's 117 rooms, 120 rooms, 111, 76, 170. Also still not yet on the market. There will be one in the River Arts District and a couple in Tunnel Road. The rooms added to all of those that are already here now from these 13 hotels would be 1,323. With the flat iron, these are kind of old numbers. I didn't include the nine that just got taken away, but 1,403. And if we include the embassy suites, which we're currently unsure of, 1,588 rooms on top of everything that is already here. Council members Mayfield and Smith, I, I'm hoping that your positions have not changed on the flat iron building despite the one floor of office space they have now said they are going to maintain. I do not mean any disrespect when I say that Mr. Thompson, the owner of the building, sounds to me less like a man who has selflessly offered reasonably priced office space, but rather an irresponsible business owner who did not take care of his investment. In the same way that none of you would help pay for my falling down house. I don't think we should be asked to pay for his falling, his building that needs repairs. Let's make a plan for Asheville's future that makes sense, and let's start doing that today, as you promised to do before you voted to allow a 90-foot tall hotel just a few steps from Biltmore Avenue, just north of the hospital. That was a while ago, and for reasons that I still do not understand, you are continuing to stall to make a plan or a stand for Asheville and the people who live here. Many thanks for voting this project down once and for all. 
this project is definitely not in the best interest of the public. Thank you. Thank you. The red chair. Council, Mayor, I know everyone's tired and I will be very brief. My name is Victoria Marino and I uh, currently work and have worked right in the heart of the downtown for the last nine years. So during that period of time I've seen tremendous increase in volume and traffic and so forth on the downtown streets, primarily Haywood Street and Battery Park as many have already talked about. And this project will not enhance that at all. Instead, it's taking away parking as well as bringing in a tremendous volume of people that are already going to utilize the parking that's available now. And I too, like some of the business owners here on a weekly basis, uh, locals commenting about they don't like to come downtown anymore. They don't feel like the city caters to the community and they do anything they can to try to avoid coming downtown. And I don't think that's what we're striving for. You know, we, um, each of the businesses have very unique offerings and it's um, mm -hmm. all this growth is just taking away from the quaint feel that the city did offer and that we want to try to preserve. And I, would, I, there are, I certainly agree that the building needs to be preserved, but I think there's other avenues with the Preservation Society and things that can be involved to aid with that project versus what's on the table now. And I hope that you'll strongly consider uh, declining approval of that. Thank you. In the bare back. Council members, I'm grateful to address you one more time. Hi, I'm Reverend Amy Cantrell. I keep wondering throughout this as we talk about change of use for a building, where we had the change of use hearing for our city. And I heard particularly as y'all talked about Lee Walker and how you felt about it. And there's a lot of local people that have a lot of feelings, a lot of love for our city. And somehow our city's getting lost along the way. Have we had a change of use about our city. Have we had that hearing? Because we need to, because a lot of us that love our city feel like it's been taken and being taken. I saw Abby's face as she walked out. And I see a lot of faces of people that are getting pushed out. And I see a lot of faces of people laying down their bodies on the very street we're talking about. So what are we trying to preserve? is my question. What are we trying to preserve? Without a vision, the people perish. And we have an amazing vision. But without living into our vision, the people are perishing. What happens to a local place when it's no longer local anymore? These are the questions that keep coming up. And the change of use of this building, welcome our new city attorney. Appreciate you being here. And one of the things you said is, does this, is this in the best interest of the people of the city? And I think lots of people have said, no, no, no. And I'll just say no. And the other thing is, is it reasonable? And you ask what is reasonable, and Webster gives a definition, even if the statute doesn't. Having sound judgment, fair and sensible. And here are the synonyms. Sensible, rational, fair, just, equitable, decent. So is this reasonable? Is 1,300 more rooms or 1,400 more or 1,500 more just, equitable, decent? I don't think so. Vote no tonight and in the future. Thank you. My name is Matilda. 
that this project is still being considered is throwing so many of us for a loop. I attended the first tourism management and investment plan meeting two weeks ago, a day after council approved yet another pro-police, pro-developer, pro-tourist, pro-wealthy city budget. You cannot claim to be looking out for black Asheville and poor and working class Asheville while approving such budgets. That aside, Mayor Mannheimer has claimed that the TDA's TMIP is working on issues associated with tourism, tourism's burden on infrastructure. She has used this to approve hotels. The nefarious activities, as mentioned tonight, aside, another hotel is not what we need. Mannheimer mentioned Manager Campbell's confusion about the public's view of tourism. No, many of us are not enthusiastic about our city and our ecological future being stolen from us, as tourism produces 8% of the total, car total carbon emissions worldwide, and the GDP of tourism is increasing at five times the rate of the global GDP. But GDP for whom? The UN says we have till 2030 to solve the climate emergency, and improving this hotel is not the way. And having attended the TMIP meeting, I can say that many of us felt ignored. As people who many of us struggle, our voices matter, and we are stakeholders. We do not trust this process. We do not need another hotel, and we will fight your hotels every chance we get. Thank you. Jonathan. He's learning PowerPoint. I know that horrifies you. Oh. Wait, you're, you're going to do a PowerPoint, Jonathan? That's right. OK. It's not very fancy. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wayne Scott. I don't think this is my presentation. Um, uh, that's OK. I can do with that. I'll do another one in a little bit. No, that's really Oh, there it is. There you go. All right, so a few weeks ago, my name is Jonathan Wayne Scott. I also won a Griffin Award for Historic Preservation several years ago. Um, how do you go forward unless you do that? This is the uh, Flatiron Building in Chicago. I used to live in this uh, neighborhood. You can see that uh, there's the skyline in the background, uh, which is what makes the Flatiron Building different from our Flatiron Building in a lot of ways. Um, ours is downtown, this one is not. And uh, ours is uh, six or seven stories, and this one is only three. It doesn't have nearly the same kind of uh, prominence that uh, we have uh, with ours in Asheville, and the Flatiron Building is located, uh, you know, in a, a very diverse neighborhood, uh, Wicker Park, Bucktown area. It's kind of like West Asheville. That's my old apartment right there, and I used to live a half a mile away from it. And here is our uh, Flatiron Building. As you can see, it's it's quite a bit different. I'm just you know saying that so that you know next time you compare apples to apples, you don't go to the Apple Store and buy a, an iPad and come back with that instead. So this is the um, the Flatiron Building again in Chicago. Uh, you, the, it's the one over there on the left, you can't see it very well. Um, the young woman just a minute ago who was mentioning the uh, boutique ho uh, hotel uh, number 11, it's on Roberts uh, Street. It is in the River Arts District. Uh, one of the reasons that you don't have a hotel in the Flatiron Building in Chicago is because you don't have any hotels in that neighborhood whatsoever. Um, but this is the one, this is the boutique hotel that's going on on Robert Street, which is right down the street from Mr. Haynes, who owns two houses right there and voted for that uh, one. So um, it should be a little bit of consistency with the values of uh, how we vote on things. I'm, I'm also kind of concerned with the city wagging such a, a you know, heavy finger over deferred maintenance when you know, we've been put in a jam to come up and get our pavement schedule from, I think it fell to 80 years, and then we only brought it up to 30, and optimum is 20. So you know, the city does a pretty bad job when it comes to deferred maintenance uh, as it is. Um, and just, you know, the one thing that I found that was kind of interesting with the uh, comparison to Chicago and Asheville is that um, the hotel tax in Chicago, the city portion of it brings in $140 million 
for the city of Chicago. And their Choose Chicago, which is like Explore Asheville, they have an operating budget of $30 million. Ours is $25 million. We're spending as much money almost as Chicago is, and that's not per capita, that is total. So these hotels are a symptom of an overheated tourism economy. If you're tired of hotels, and you're gonna have to do something about reducing the demand of, ho of you know, the tourism economy in general. And you're gonna have to do something with the hotel tax, which isn't in your wheelhouse to do anything with. It is with the legislature, but we are not on very good terms with the state legislature right now. And I don't think we're gonna be in, in, in uh, any greater, uh, you know, friendship with them in the, in the, the short term. So Thank anyway, you. there you Thank go, you, and there's John. the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thanks, man. <laughs> okay, uh, someone in, in the very back. Oh, that's okay. You two fight it out. <laughs> you two arm wrestle over it. Everybody will get their chance. You guys are so much closer now. My name is Meredith Bodkin, and I am uh, representing Isa's Bistro. I'm the restaurant manager there. Um, I'd like to bring up um, the concerns of how our locals would be affected. Um, Right now, we've really focused on um, having return customers that are living locally um, in a location that is attached to a hotel. So for us, we really value any customer that comes in and returns and um, lives locally. Uh, part of what we can offer them is valet parking that's complimentary through the Haywood Park Hotel. And my concern is losing those customers due to um, the traffic that would happen during construction and even upon completion of the project. Um, so I would just ask that you keep that in consideration. Also, would, we have a lot of walk-in and traffic, um, walk-in business through foot traffic, and I'm afraid that construction there would also affect that. Um, so just keep us in consideration and my staff and the locals that we may lose um, due to that. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you. There was someone else over, this lady, and then I'll... My name is Leslie Kulba, and uh, I, I appreciate the good intentions of everybody. Um, I've said before that the thing about politics is we all want to be good to each other. We just have different ideas about how to go about it. And I tend to lean libertarian. I tend to think that government does best when it looks out for the rights of everybody. That includes the rich people, includes the poor people. And also there are statistics to show that when government is smallest, when there's the most economic freedom, there is the most prosperity. So when I see government trying to step in and regulate, I see gentrification as a consequence. Um, the fact is I've heard um, the owner, Russell Thomas, uh, um, people say he was a slumlord, and analogies drawn to a person's individual home. Well, if I ran a home, and I could not keep, well, may, you know, maybe I was a tinkerer and I could keep it up, but when I needed to put it on the market, I would have to do things to get it marketable. And, you know, I don't know the details, but that's what appears to be the situation. And so, uh, you know, to get this thing to sell, a lot of money has to go into it. And Mr. Um, Thomas has a buyer. What if he doesn't have another buyer? A lot of the solutions I've heard tonight have disdained money and wanted government to step in, government funds. Well, government gets its money through taxation, which means more money coming out of the local economy. And uh, just one more thing in closing, I, I used to work in the Flatiron Building you know, in the late, 90, late 80s and early 90s. And you know, I, I can't say that I'm that much better than a tourist. There were four of us working in the office and we all would leave a couple times during our shift. We had people, we had clients and visitors coming in to talk to us. And I can't see, you know, again, what happens a lot in economic arguments is we forget to subtract what's already existing in our comparisons. And I think that about does it. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman in the green shirt. No, mm -hmm. oh, it's not green shirt. My name is Dale Davidson. Um, yes, would you speak up a little speak bit? Speak louder, can you hear me? Yeah, that's I'm okay. sorry. 
I'm afraid there are thousands of people at home watching this. <laughs> <laughs> your, your oh, yeah, there. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. They My name is Dale you. Davidson. Uh, I'm a local resident. If this was a, uh, in terms of a uh, hotel that was being planned for something from the ground up, I surely do believe that there are plenty of hotels in Asheville. I don't think there's a shortage. Um, but I do love this old Flatiron building, and my fear is how can this be saved? I've heard wonderful suggestions. I mean, if we could put homeless people in there, that, that, would, be, that would be tremendous. I can't think of a better use of that building. But I'm under the impression that to restore a building it costs so much more than it does to construct a whole new building or to tear down a new building. And I sure don't want to see this torn down. Am I wrong to think this is going to cost millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars to, to do whatever project it is? And as much as another hotel is not the most appealing thing, do you all know of any other projects that are possible that will supply that kind of money to save this building? And if you do, that would be a great discussion. But if this is the only way to save this building, I'm afraid I'm very greedy and I'd like to save this beautiful building. Thank you very much. Thank you. No way. Yep, we'll wait in the back. I'm Drea Jackson. I was talked last time at this meeting, and I'm even more disorganized this time than last because I was really surprised to have it come back before City Council this quickly. I felt really positive about where things left off that the developer was going to do community outreach, find out you know what kind of feedback there was, if there were other possible solutions to create a mixed use building, but I didn't hear of any meetings, any outreach, any anything, and I would like to think that I've have a little bit of, you know, an ear to what's going on in the city. Um, but I was not aware of any of that. And I think that speaks to a lot of what I'm hearing tonight, which is this level of transparency between developers and locals. And to me, it doesn't seem to be happening in this situation. And maybe if it was, then the backlash wouldn't be happening. Maybe if people understood more about where the developer was coming from and they knew who they spoke with about these other opportunities or whether financing was available for a different model, then they would have something to refer to. But instead, it's like these blanket statements of, well, we talked to people and we had these meetings and this is what we have. So to me, that's a little short-sighted for a community that is basically begging to try to save this building. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention that I didn't get to talk about last time was that um, part of the historic preservation isn't just for the actual building itself, but one of the caveats in the um, preservation guidelines that talks about what is to be preserved is the feeling and association of a structure and how it adds to the time and place and the historical development of a community. And so this is like the perfect definition of what that is. It was built as offices, it's been offices the entire time. It's been incubators. A lot of the original real estate development companies that were in that building are the ones that planned all of Asheville, all of the neighborhoods of Asheville. Insurance companies that, you know, it's, it's what people have come to know as the entrepreneur center of Asheville. And so to casually dismiss that and say there's other office space, it doesn't do its service as what it actually means for, for the community um, in that standpoint. Something else I wanted to bring up was the city and the UDO recognizes the um, stress on infrastructure that a hotel creates because right now the only use in the CBD that is required to provide parking is a hotel. And when council decided or when whoever wrote all of the um, guidelines for what that was, they're, they're recognizing that there's an extra burden on a hotel use in our downtown district to do something about that. And so I think to someone else's point earlier about all of the bathrooms, all of the water, all of that, the infrastructure burden, I think is a good, is a good point to consider. One thing I wanted to bring up as far as the money being talked about, the bond money, and I dove a little bit into the Citizen Times, I Thank wish. you. Can I Appreciate email it. those articles? Yes, absolutely. To you? OK. Right. That would be great. You can. OK. Anybody else? Oh, come on, there's got to be one person who hasn't spoken. 
just kidding. Just, I do want to thank you all for being very polite and quiet. I really, it makes, I really appreciate it. So I am going to close the public hearing. All right. Uh, uh, so if council members would like to speak, um, I. Sure, I, I can kick it off. Okay. Um, Quinn. So um, uh, first off, I you know I, I appreciate all the all the folks who've showed up here and who've uh, who've emailed us, um, who've talked to us, and um, you know who've, who've just really reached out to us on this issue. As I've just kind of said before, this is like one of those situations where um, you know all the city I think focuses uh, a lot of their concerns on a particular uh, building or, or, or entity and um, the Flatiron building sure, certainly captured that um, in terms of kind of my evolution of, of where I got to where I got um, I can remember I think it was almost about a year ago when um, uh, someone uh, reached out to me as from part of this group to say that they were considering turning the Flatiron Building into a hotel, and I thought they were crazy. Um, I thought there would be no way that I would um, support that. Um, I, for many of the reasons that you all have said here tonight, for many of the reasons that um, I've been emailed um, from, uh, from a lot of folks around the city. Um, what changed my mind was repeated meetings with them. I think I met four particular times sitting down and actually asking some hard questions, and I sat down one time with, with Councilwoman Mayfield, um, and ask some, some tough questions about that to really kind of understand what the project was and really ask questions about what the other options were. Um, and because I wanted, I wanted to get to the heart of it. Um, I wanted to really understand and kind of probe. And, and those of you who kind of seen me over the last year um, know I tend to do that um, on, on council. Um, that's, that's part of just my personality and part of what I think is important that elected officials do. Um, I'll tell you, the developer was, was very willing to meet with all of us on council, and I think reached out to all of us at some point uh, to do so. Um, and, and in order to do so, and, and, and look, that's in their best interest to do it. You know, you, you understand that when you sit down with them, you're going to hear what, what their position is. But you also have the opportunity to talk to them. You also have the opportunity to request information for them. You have the ability to ask them, what are the alternative uses for this? You ask them for what the data is. Ask them for what the, what the, uh, what the detailed numbers are. Um, and I did that. Uh, and I did that, I did that several times. And what, what came, became very clear to me in terms of the facts, and I think these are, these are really undisputable, is currently there's not a sprinkler system in here. Currently they have uh, elevators uh, that uh, are, are like the ones in City Hall, and if things break down, they've got to have parts specially made. They need a new HVAC unit uh, they, for the building. Uh, they need to basically redo their electrical system. That costs an incredible amount of money, uh, and they came and showed us that that's going to cost to turn it into office space, right, which is where I think a lot of folks have been and, and are encouraging to do, would cost $10.5 million. Uh, and that is on top of the purchase price. And, and, and all of us on council here have the ability and have the ability to go to them and say, show us the numbers on this and push. And they've, they've given us months to do that. That's not just in the last couple of weeks. They've reached out to us a long, long time ago. And, and that's part of the reason why I don't see a need to, motion, for, to, to postpone this. We've had the opportunity to do it. And, and if we haven't met with them and haven't taken the time to do it, that's on us. That's, that's not on them. Uh, and so, so in my mind, you know, uh, I, I hear what folks are saying tonight, and, and, and I'm, I'm incredibly sympathetic to the concerns about the small businesses, but long term, I do not see this building be able to continue in the way it is now. I just don't see the economics of that working. And, and for that reason, um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been convinced that the proposal in front of us is I think in the long term best interest of preserving this building for the city of Asheville in the long term, and that's why I'll be I'll be making a motion to uh, to approve it later. Okay. Well, I'm going to weigh in here. Uh, I voted for less hotels than any other member of the council other than Councilman Haynes. Uh, my voting record certainly suggests that I strive to look at each zoning decision individually. I focus on our plans, congestion, neighborhood compatibility, the project's potential enhancement to the city, and preservation along with other factors.
This project, including the retention of one floor of office space and developing a solution for parking, has improved since its first submittal. I've also, along with BJ, looked at the costs to renovate the building and the potential income from office tenants. I don't believe that office rents can support the cost to renovate the building to have viable heating, cooling, and health safety infrastructure. People may say that the owners should have been keeping the building up and we shouldn't have to, we shouldn't be in a position to have these significant costs facing them. Maybe, but we are where we are. And I want to see the Flatiron building remain. I don't want to look back 10 years from now watching the building get torn down because it wasn't kept up or that the results of its poor health safety infrastructure caused tenants or our first responders harm. And while I'd love to see another use for this building, I don't think the numbers work out. And losing the building to me doesn't seem to be the right answer. So because of all that, I will be voting for this project. Anyone else wanna? Sure, I'll weigh in. Weigh in. So as I said last time, um, I think the, the goal that everyone shares about this project is the preservation of this historic, iconic, and really beautiful building. Um, I and obviously many others wish that that could happen with the building remaining in its current use as offices for local businesses. That would absolutely be the best outcome. At the last hearing, as you've heard, council raised a number of concerns, starting with the fundamental question of whether there were other options for the future of the building. The developer did meet our request and met with both opponents and neutral parties to determine if there were other viable options, other viable options, and none emerged, nor have any emerged from any other source in the six weeks that this has been part of the public dialogue. The developer also partially addressed our concern about displacement of local businesses by dedicating one floor for offices, not as much as we, as we might have wanted, but it is an improvement over the previous proposal. They have also met my concerns around parking and valet issues. With these requests having been met and concerns having been addressed and there being no clear path to a different future use for the flat iron, I am now compelled to support this project. I am not happy about this decision, but I cannot keep moving the goalposts just to avoid a vote I don't like. I stand by my statement that we are sunk if the only way for property owners in downtown to be successful is to build a hotel. But this building is different for many reasons, and I can understand how the only path forward for this building involves the high return that comes only with a hotel. I do not like it, but I understand it. So based on the information available to me, I am choosing a certain future of adaptive reuse and preservation of the Flatiron over an uncertain future that includes continued decline. My final comment is that I want to walk back something I said at the last meeting, that this building represents the soul of the city. Even though others have said the same, upon reflection, the soul of our city is not embodied in a building, even one as special as the Flatiron. Instead, it is in the beautiful, messy, complex mix of our highly engaged people and businesses who disagree and fight, but who also come together and work hard on a daily basis to make our city a better place. That is the soul of this city. Any, anyone else? Yes. Um, I'll be brief. We have continued work to do as it pertains to the issues of tourism and hotels here in the city of Asheville and how we approach on a case by case basis or if we continue to do such and where we go to move forward. Uh, votes have already proved. We haven't voted yet, but in the, in the interim, it seems as though this will pass. It won't get my support. It won't get my vote. Um, I believe there is an aspect of the public interest that has not been met tonight, and I will support that public interest. And we do need to do someone. Someone made a statement earlier. I don't remember which person it was in the audience. I can't remember if, if you're here, raise your hand if you remember what, what I'm getting ready to say. Uh, how many rooms is enough, and what what do we determine is a saturation in downtown, and how do we how do we make 
these specific stipulations on what we do and do not want uh, in our downtown core and how that shapes the way that Asheville fundamentally will look not only in the next six months but the next 60 years and what those proposed outcomes may be and how these hotels may or may not transform over that time period. Um, the city manager has challenged us to do such, I believe so. We have not met that challenge. I believe this is now a good opportunity to go back to the drawing board and figure it out. Uh, and of course, the public should be a big part of that. Um, how that moves forward at this juncture, I do not know. But I do know that this isn't working. Um, it's not working for developers, and it's not working for uh, folks who have uh, interest in the public that Asheville um, grows in a way that they can remain here and their uh, way of life is not greatly affected. Um, a lot of people move to Asheville, a lot of people are here in Asheville and people have come. I had a conversation with somebody and they said, you know, lots of people have come to Asheville uh, in a time period where you may have come here in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s or a couple of months ago and what your perfect Asheville is is kind of frozen in time when you got here if you came here for a specific place. And we are challenged with as elected officials to sometimes we're expected to please everybody and we don't get to please everybody. But what we can do is keep the public's interest at heart and make sure that we shape our city moving forward that is going to be in the best interest of those that do remain here, that, of those that do pay taxes, um, residents including businesses, businesses. And we all need to have a seat at the table and figure out how do we make Asheville what we want it to be moving forward. And some things we don't have, we don't have control over, you know. Um, and I don't want to ramble on, but this doesn't seem to be working. And we need to figure it out. We need to answer the call of the city manager and we need to um, invoke uh, the interests of the public a bit more and also balance the needs of how growth happens in this city in a meaningful way. Uh, I'll, I'll digress at that. I won't be supporting it, um, but it does look like it'll pass. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I will move to approve the conditional zoning request for the Flatiron Building from Central Business District to Central Business Expansion District for the renovation of the existing building for lodging and ancillary uses and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest, and is consistent with the Asheville Living Comprehensive Plan because one, the downtown future land use category of the Living Asheville Comprehensive Plan allows for hotels, two, rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of the iconic Flatiron Building will preserve this historic landmark and will be done under close and appropriate review. Three, the project provides much needed life safety upgrades. And four, proposed streetscape enhancements will improve the public realm by activating the area and allowing for more flexibility of the use of Battery Park Avenue. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Okay, so all those in favor, let's raise hands. And, and Esther, what's your vote? You, Esther, are you in favor? Um, are you talking to me? It's yes. really hard to hear you. Yes, I'm sorry. Are you in favor, Esther? I, I vote I, I vote yes okay. in favor of the motion. Okay. And those opposed, raise your hand. You got it? Okay, great. Thank you very much. If you're if you're leaving I'm just Thank you. Okay, so now uh, we don't have unfinished business or new business, so I'm moving into public comment. Uh, once again, the, the rules are three minutes. If you have three other people who will yield, yield their time, you get 10 minutes. Uh, the way it works is the green light says go, the yellow says it's getting to the end, and the red says stop. And public comment is open to anything that was not on the agenda or previously discussed t tonight. So I'm first going to go through the people who've signed up, but even if you didn't sign up and you want to speak, you will get an opportunity after, I get, after we get done with the people who signed up um, on paper. So the first person I have is Reed Thompson. Okay. I think Mr. Thompson's outside, so we're going to go find him.
Okay, so then I move to Brandy Boggs. Okay, I'm sorry. Come on up. Okay, Mr. Thompson, do you three minutes or? Uh, well, I'd if, like to do six and have someone come up with me, but I don't know if you'll well, let you me can, do that. If three people yield their time, you can have up to I, I, ten they're minutes. Ju there are just two of us, and I've got two little presentations okay. here. Maggie, do you think you could? I know, I'm sorry. Uh, I was, I came in this afternoon okay. and I was told all I had to do was drag this over to here and, yeah, well, hold on. and it'll hold on. play. And now there's something else in there. Okay, let's start from scratch. This, this, and what is it that you want to bring over? Uh, if I click on this right here. Okay, and then drag that over there. Because there was a water leak and my neighbor's water line was broken and I was helping my neighbor. That same police officer witnessed a garbage truck for a private contractor at a private business that purges itself every time it comes to our street, all the way down the street. It smells like sour milk. We were going to fix a problem nine months ago with trucks on Maxwell Street. I'm here ask Ms. Campbell for the enabled legislation for commercial trucks on a residential street where I can't even have an Airbnb to be able to dump garbage down my street. And if there is the enabled legislation, I would like a copy of it. And if there's not, somebody needs to get the police department on the page that they're not out there to harass Reed Thompson they're out there to do something about the trucks because I can't even stand on a sidewalk in front of a house that I own because the trucks have the right of way over the pedestrians on your city sidewalks, according to your police department. So if that's the case, I would also like a copy of the enabled legislation that says trucks have the right over pedestrians. I'd also like a copy of the enabled legislation that allows a sidewalk to be con turned into a loading dock and the street to be turned into a loading dock without any due process. And if the due process didn't happen, Julie, we need to issue a notice of violation just like we would read Thompson. So do the laws apply to us all equally? Or do we have two tiers of laws? One for one side of the street and one for the other. Because if I can't stand on the sidewalk across from a property that I own without being arrested, we have a problem. And it's government. And it's the way government's been run for 10 years, 15 years. Gary Jackson, in my opinion. Thank you. Brandy Boggs. No. Okay. 
this was a mix-up. I don't know how that one got it. I don't know what we're going to see here. We're all going to watch it at the same time. I'm Brandy Bob. I'm a Maxwell Street resident. And um, I'm taking a long break from this podium. It's been a hard break. I hope y'all do something about it. This has gone on too long. In June of 2018, the city was going through an amendment process with the Living Asheville Plan. At that time, Mr. Thompson was in the agreement with Maxwell Street, the property with Star on it, that's Maxwell Street, and all the properties were listed as um, traditional corridor uh, development packs, which are allowing for residential areas to grow in commercial mixed use patterns, um, including lodging. While the process was going on, Mr. Thompson's case was continued for a month. At the time of continuance, staff amended the plan without a public process, without public notice, and without even notifying us that they were changing the map to what's on the right, which takes it from commercial or traditional corridor to the traditional neighborhood, which goes from commercial mixed use downgrading to residential only. Now, in doing this, they go against the best practices of comprehensive plans by not encouraging the um, dealing with conflict inside neighborhoods and there happens to be a very loud or very not That's my house. That's green life, load and duck. Externalized into Maxwell Street, right in front of the subject properties. Not only did they not consider that, they didn't even bother really with the process. In fact, they make it worse by now bringing everything to traditional corridor. They never engaged Mr. Thompson nor myself in the plan to let us know that they were changing the process again, which is in conflict with our best practices and comprehensive plans. They also didn't solve the issues that are uh, part of the process with the conflict of zoning or the loading bay and residential. So we have this process. They ignore also the existing commercial uses on the street, as well as uh, downgrading everything that's existing zoning. Uh, Mr. Thompson's house and property are all currently zoned in the commercial district which is a higher intensity commercial district. So they basically put comprehensive element plans in place to downgrade that to residential. Um, and that also is in conflict with the existing uses on the street are actually of a higher density than what's allowed in the, in the projected comprehensive plan. They also conflict with the proper corridor plan, which calls for the whole entire block to be purple, which is a traditional mixed use neighborhood of a new urban pattern. And they downgrade it all to residential which is also in conflict with the existing uses and the um, uh, projects that are already built on the street. So not only did they fail to notify Mr. Thompson, they failed to notify people in the neighborhood, but they also go in conflict with local area plans, best practices of planning, and existing conflicts on the street. In June of 2018, the city was going through an amendment process with the living national plan. Okay, At that thank you. Thanks. I feel like we've already gotten this, but Joe Minicosi's next. I believe that was your voice on the... <laughs> <laughs> I want to see your puppet. I should have brought a puppet. <laughs> Puppets aren't allowed. Yeah, no puppets. Gamble the puppet. Um, for the record, Joe Minicosi, 62 Maxwell, or 62 Cortland Avenue. Um, I want to start by talking about enforcement. And get this. It just takes a little longer. There you go. Okay. So this is the enforcement uh, requirements of our UDO that the planning director is authorized to enforce the law on the street, which hasn't been enforced. Um, we have the first planning director of this case, Scott Schuford, called the street commercial. We have Bob Ost, city attorney, interpret the street as mixed use, and then we have Todd Oglachaney seeing the street as residential, which denied, you all denied, Mr. Thompson's application. So we have the city calling the street three different things. Um, there's a notice of violation that should go out for all those truck violations, those trucks that park on the sidewalks, the, uh, the, the gravel parking lot that's on the other side. But what was interesting was uh, a, a former counselor Cecil Bothwell wrote in an email last week that he tried to get counsel to budge on this. So you all have had conversations privately about this, neither closed door session or some of the conversation where you've had discussions about this, and yet our staff isn't following through with their duty of enforcing the law. Now we have a state statute of uh, North Carolina General Statute 14230 
that says that any city official um, shouldn't neglect their, op or their obligation to enforce the law and shouldn't meddle with such a process, get in the way with a staff doing their job. So either the staff isn't doing their job or you all are meddling with their opportunity to do the job, which is a violation um, and you shall be indicted and shall be guilty of a class one misdemeanor and also removal from office. So I'm just gonna leave this up there for the rest of my two, three minutes because I think this is important for folks at home to be aware of this. This has been going on for 15 years that there are rules that should be applied equally on both sides of the street. There's a due process violation of how the city initially adopted this and, enforced, and allowed variances to happen without due process. And yet individuals are suffering on the street and having the law upheld on them on one side of the street, but not for others on the other side of the street. And that's patently unfair and against what you all swore in to do. So I'm just gonna go ahead and leave this there and we can go until the end of the three minutes. So thank you. And by the way, three of you are attorneys. So I don't know if Esther's still on the phone. Thank you. Terrence Major. Okay. Katie Fogg. Sandy Aldridge. Aldridge, I'm sorry. Um, I thank you all for uh, providing this forum for public to speak on things. Um, domestic violence is, was my main issue for this evening, but I'm not local, so of course I'm going to comment on what we need in the city. Um, domestic violence um, has to be brought up again. Uh, the campaign of enough is enough has faded away. Um, it has to be brought back and something even better, actually. I myself am, am still having to deal with domestic violence issues, even though my last attack was in November of 2017. I have to go tomorrow, okay? Um, and talking with a gentleman who works for the Sheriff's Department, you know, brought up something earlier today when I was trying to investigate this myself. Um, maybe I'll need a lawyer. But I shouldn't need the lawyer because the state is supposed to be fighting for me. But I don't feel like that's the case, okay? Um, so even though I don't really want to go tomorrow, I will go because I'm standing for the women that have had to deal with that, current women that are dealing with it, and the future women that may have to deal with that. And as far as women and children who are dying in this community, in my town, okay, it's, it's a no, okay? It's not working for us. Um, and this is just the beginning. I have limited time, but this is just the beginning. Because um, there will follow, uh, there will be protests, there will be all kinds of things in the city. Because we as the public are demanding it. And um, we're beautiful people, we match the mountains, just like Buncombe County Seal says. And we're gonna fight for our people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah Benoit. <clears throat> Thank you again, my name is Sarah Benoit, and I'm just here tonight to say I'm really looking forward to next week talking about the redistricting issue, which is something that's been very important to me the last few months. Um, I will say I appreciate uh, Councilman Kapoor putting together all the information that he did to share with everybody. Um, I mean, I think I draw very different conclusions from the data that you shared, um, but I'm glad that there's a very uh, clear discourse about what we need to do. So I just want to say thank you to especially the three of you who have really stepped up um, to speak out against this. I think it's going to be an important conversation that we have next week and I really appreciate that the public will hopefully be invited to participate in that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who else would like to speak? Jonathan. 
You have a PowerPoint? Yeah. All right. You're stepping it up. That's right. Exactly. Just for me, right? Oh, no, this is for all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my name is Jonathan Wainscott. In regards to the uh, district elections that have been described as basically in a ra uh, racial assault on uh, Asheville and a stealing of democracy and all that kind of stuff, the narrative has been, you know, this, this was led by, uh, you know, racist Republican Chuck Edwards, who then uh, co-opted Terry Van Dyne, who brought in uh, the even-eared amendment, and uh, she was labeled as a a traitor and a turncoat, and I guess maybe that's to the Democratic Party, I'm not really sure, maybe it's to Asheville, I don't know exactly what else. But I think that we should look at the rest of the, um, the uh, senators that did vote for this. This was a unanimous vote by the uh, Senate, uh, Senate Bill uh, 813, and that means that there were these turncoat Democrat racists that voted for it. We got Mike Woodard up there, he looks like a racist. And we got Jeff Jackson, Jonathan. who looks like a really handsome racist. And then we got Jay, uh, Jay, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, maybe. Chaudhry. Chaudhry, oh right, yeah, he's racist. Um, and then we've got Dan Blue who voted for it, he's a turncoat, oh my word, man. Look at that guy, he's, he's making a racial attack on Asheville and so is Gladys Robinson and so is Floyd McKissick Jr. He voted for uh, Senate Bill 813, so did Ben Clark, and so did Don Davis, and so did Joyce Waddell, and so did Paul uh, Lowe Jr. And so did Milton Toby Fritch. He's from Wilson. Do you guys know anything about Wilson, North Carolina? I think that you should look it up and see what kind of uh, governance that they have here. So, you know, I appreciate that you used the word uh, debunk there earlier, uh, Mrs. Smith, because this uh, narrative of a racial attack on Asheville via the uh, North Carolina General Assembly is completely out of hand. It's not the slightest bit true. And this is not going to help us do anything with the North Carolina legislature going forward to continue this tit and, uh, for tat fight. I don't know what you think that you're gonna accomplish by trying to not uh, abide by the law that was put into place by all of these people. Let's look at them again, look at, look, look, look at all these racist people who voted for Senate Bill 813 with unanimity. You guys turn to uh, un uh, unanimous votes to be able to sort of like, hey, look, we had to do something unpopular, but I can assure you there was a lot of discussion, and this came with a, a unanimous vote. This is, this is what unanimity looks like. I don't see, I want to know why those people up there are traitors and turncoats. I want to know why Terry Van Dyne is getting thrown under the bus and she's being bullied and no one's standing up for her. She brought the even-eared amendment, which you're going to benefit from, and uh, Julie, by being able to run for Senate in the even-eared election. And you can do that and run for higher office, and, you know, unlike Keith, who tried to abandon ship in 2000, you know, like, John, to do this. Don't make it personal. I'm not, I'm not happy about this, this discourse here when it comes to, you know, uh, line about how this all came down. Thank you. Thanks. Who else would like to speak? Come on up. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, my name is John Brigham. Um, the, um, the, the, the subject is, I can't believe you guys have been sitting here for three hours. Um, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm, compl I'm completely amazed. Democracy in action. I love it. Um, this is about the, the city council, the, the Asheville City Schools, and the school board. Um, as you all know, I know you've been down this road, the Asheville City Council um, um, appoints the school board. And I think that the track record on this has been like absolutely perfect on all sides. The, 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 the Asheville City Council has taken the time to, to work on this and they've come up with a long stream of very good applicants in the Asheville City School Board. But I, th I think that an issue, and I, th I think it's a pretty overwhelmingly important one, is that the Asheville City Schools needs to be led by people that are independent of the Asheville City Schools. Two of them are retired from the Asheville City Schools. One of them, I believe, that Shonda is an, act, is an active teacher right now. And then a, a fourth one is very, very tightly tied to the Asheville City Schools. And James Carter looks totally awesome, but he's, he's um, brand new. Um, 
without changing the subject. The, the world of education, it's not, it's not a fair deal. The, the cards are not dealt evenly, and everybody knows this. There's no doubt in anybody's mind that the institutions are not fair. It's not fair, and that's just the way it is. The way it comes down in a community has to do with the demographics of, it's like the idiosyncrasies of where it is. It's just how things kind of come down. The way it comes down in Asheville is that we have a demographic that makes a, we, we've got like the rich people and the poor people, not like nowhere else in the state, and that's the demographic makes our spread different. It's bigger. And this is um, just kind of the way it, kind of the way it goes down. Um, the, 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 the Asheville City Schools is looking for a new superintendent. The superintendent, the mantra is we're closing the achievement gap and they want a superintendent that's going to close the achievement gap. We're closing the achievement gap. I guess this is, I've been here 10 years, I guess it's been going on a lot longer than that. We're trying to close the achievement gap and the superintendent needs to get on board with this. Okay, so let's, we get a, a superintendent. The superintendent's closing the achievement gap. So the superintendent comes on and says, okay, let's go to work closing the achievement gap. And they say, no, 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 we closed the achievement gap. We're going to close the achievement gap. And he says, okay, well, no, 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 no. We have funding for this. You don't understand. We have funding to close the achievement gap. We get publicity for this. And the superintendent says, but, but we, uh, no, no, no. And the superintendent figures out what's going on and finds another job. Um, I, I think that, um, okay. Um, I'm from the outside. People tell me after 10 years I'm a local, which I think is cool. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you, if, if you have prepared remarks that you want to share with council, if you'd give no, them I to. No, I think I mean, Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wants to speak in public comment? Any council members have any informal news? Anything you want to share? Okay. Thanks, Esther. Uh, so I'm adjourning the meeting.